Our guest tonight draws from expertise from forging for mushrooms in the Tasmanian wilderness to cultivating his own gourmet fungi. His journey led him to pursue a bachelor's degree specializing in plant science, microbiology, and organic chemistry, followed by a master's degree focusing on conservation mycology. But beyond his academic pursuits, he is deeply engaged in ethnobotany and the cultivation of medicinal plants. Through his writings, for respected platforms like Double Blind and Third Wave, as well as his active presence on social media, our guest invites you to explore the wonders of mycology. Join him as he shares his passion for fungi, from the forests of Tasmania to the urban landscapes of Melbourne, Australia, inspiring curiosity and appreciation for the hidden world that is always just beneath our feet. Welcome to the fascinating world of Kane Barlow. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast, a podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and we have got an amazing show for you tonight. We're going to sit down with uh, Kane Barlow. Uh, Australian uh, mycologist who's doing a lot of amazing things right now. Um, but before we get into that, let's, you know, let's do a little roll call, right? Shout outs. We're, we're going to shout some people out. Shout out to Stealthy Spores. He's got winter and spring decks available right now. Um, get them while they're hot. Get them while they're hot. They're, they're uh, great relics of this wonderful cultivation community that we're all a part of. Uh, Worth checking out, stealthysports.com. Use promo code geeky, uh, get you 10% off. Uh, all the little proceeds from that goes to uh, support Michael Mamas and their mycelium revolution. So uh, you'll, be, you'll be supporting them and their wonderful cause as well. Also, shout out to my Patreon supporters. I love you guys. Uh, month in and month out, you know, I'm, I'm getting more new supporters than, uh, you, you know, than, than I ever, ever thought I was going to get. So I really appreciate you guys. You guys are helping every week, make sure uh, that I can get my bills paid and we can keep doing this. So love you guys, appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, shout out to my Discord mods. You guys are amazing. Um, the Discord is really just a wonderful place to get questions answered pretty rapidly, uh, to get a wide perspective, uh, very focused responses to questions. Um, man, if you're not on Discord, I really encourage you to give it a try, uh, whether it's my Discord or somebody else's. So a uh, shout out to all my mods on there. And uh, I want to shout out uh, just everybody getting out in the woods right now. Get out in the woods. There are mushrooms popping up. There are mushrooms to learn about. Get you an iNaturalist account. Start taking some pictures. Learn how to use that thing. There's plenty of YouTube videos. You can figure out how to use it. It's not that hard. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll we'll be doing some content focused on that here uh, in in the next couple weeks. So I look forward to that. Anyway, so tonight when I uh, I had you know Ian Bollinger and a bunch of other guys on talking about HPLC uh, a little while ago, and uh, afterwards I was talking to Ian and he said I got somebody you should you should talk to this guy. So I said. Tell me who it is. Let's do it. All right. Welcome to the show, Kane Barlow. What's up, man? Hi, Geeky. Um, look, it's it's autumn here in Australia, and I guess I'm pretty excited at the moment because it's, it's mushroom season, and mushrooms are popping up everywhere. And um, I had a good afternoon yesterday. I went out for a bit of a walk, trying to scope some stuff with some educational material, and found a bunch of really nice-looking mushrooms. So... I was pretty excited by that. So now, where in Australia are you? South east? I'm in I'm in the southeast. So I'm yeah, in okay. I'm in Melbourne. I'm in in the north of Melbourne. And um, that's a good place to be for mushrooms down there, right? It's okay. It's, okay. it's what's the it's, best? Victoria? 
Oh, oh okay. Oh, you're going to start arguments now. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, I want to hear it. What's like if I'm going to go? Victoria I... is pretty good for for mushrooms. Um, there's definitely a lot of really good edibles here. Also, some fairly reasonable uh, psychoactives here as well. Um, I, but look, I'm from Tasmania, so I'm a little bit biased. I reckon Tasmania is probably the best spot to go foraging for mushrooms. Um, more so probably because of, yeah, some of the interesting uh, phenotypes of, of my favourite psychoactive. So, All right, so um, that, that, that the hometown holds a special spot in your heart. It's just... Oh, it really does. <laughs> to be expected. That's, that's fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, man. Well, so you uh, you hit my radar because, you know, it, in this little American cube cultivating community, uh, you know, not all the white papers, you know, hit, hit our radar, but there are definitely certain ones that start circulating around. People start talking about them. The more serious cultivators slash, you know, pseudo mycologists. And uh, so Alistair McTaggart's uh, recent paper uh, that he we've been watching videos of him talk about, um, I saw your name on there and I ended up, I can't even remember what I watched, but another video and, and you were in that video. So I'm like, all right, who's this guy? And I'm like, cool. I, and I thought, I can't even get this guy on the show. I'm not even going to bug him yet. I'm going to wait till, you, you know, I got something really good to talk to him about. And then I was talking to Ian Bollinger on the show not too long ago. And after yeah. the show, he goes, man, you know who you need to get on next? And he said your name. And I was like, great. Yeah. Do you know him? Can you get me Can you get me in, uh, in touch with him? And so here we are. We're doing it. It's great. I'm happy. Yeah, no, cool. Uh, Ian's lovely. Ian's, I have a lot of time for Ian. He, he's a great dude. So, um, And he's so passionate about about passionate um, great communicator all of the things that he's yes. into <laughs> yes, i agree so, but very good educator as well um yeah yeah i i i dig him um, definitely so, a shout out to ian so and, yeah we and, that's and a little subtle shout out yep. yeah and that's how some of the best guests come about is just somebody says hey this was fun and now let me tell you another guy i know that you might like to talk to so yeah mm -hmm. keep them coming guys i love it um, so let's do this. This is what we do with everybody. I like to find out everybody's first mushroom memory. You know, like uh, we're, we're going to do the first mushroom memory, and then we're going to go straight into like your Michael origin story. How do you go from seeing a mushroom to kind of like me being totally and utterly obsessed with mushrooms? Okay, so I grew up in rural Tasmania, uh, down in far south Tasmania, uh, and my grandfather had a a cattle farm and so one of my first memories of looking for and foraging for mushrooms was foraging for agaricus on here on his farm with my with my grandmother and but also my mother as well and going out and collecting some nice fieldies and you know mushrooms on toast on on cold autumn mornings so, yeah i like it so now how, how young were you? So was this just like as young as you can even possibly remember? This was like, gee, look, I probably would have been about four. We, we, we spent a little bit of time living on the farm. So when I, yeah, when I was about three or four, so that would be my earliest mushroom memories. And now were your parents odd? Like, was it odd <laughs> to be into mushrooms or is that like a bit of the culture down there? I think that was a bit of the culture. Yeah, no, I, I think most people were out kind of picking mushrooms off on their farms and, cool. yeah, having, having some really nice autumn mushrooms on toast. Um, you know, like... I love that. Foraging autumn agaricus. Mushrooms. Yes. Foraging agaricus. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, uh, you're foraging good. agaricus is... I, I think they're actually probably the best. You know, like some of the... The, the scents and, and the flavors you get from, from wild agaricus are just delicious. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, I got a neighbor down the street, about a mile and a half down the street, and he had a couple of pi old pine trees, you know, barely hanging on, but still doing, doing all right. And in the shade every year, I get the biggest flushes of horse mushrooms there. Mm -hmm. And I go over, he doesn't want anything to do with them. And they are hands down one of my favorite, absolute favorite yeah. mushrooms to eat. And uh, 
I'm like, wow, these do not taste like the button mushrooms that I get at the grocery store. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're 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 prime. They're that's a gourmet flavor yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, and you were doing that all the time when you were young. That's so cool. Well, not all the time. No, that was probably just that particular period of of my life. Um, you, you, you <laughs> but it was normal. It was normal for it you to was. eat mushrooms. Do you know how yeah. abnormal that is in many other places in the world, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. you that you're I oh look, and that that's probably a point that I'm going to come back to later on is this whole kind of thing about microphobia, yeah. uh, you know, and and how that actually affects us culturally and our perspective yeah. towards towards fungi. But um, but yeah, we can come back to that. Uh, good topic. Good topic. Um, all right. So, okay. So that's the first mushroom mem- memory. At what point in your life do you go, okay, this is more than just something I want to put on my toast in the, in the fall. Right. I think I can probably narrow it down to when I was 15, I read the teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda, uh, a rather interesting book for a 15 year old to read. Um, but also probably to preface that a little bit now, and I don't know if, if you're old enough, or I don't think I found out how old you are. I'm, but I'm old. I'm 47. I, I, then you yeah, should be I'll able be to remember okay. this. Uh, Omni Magazine. I don't know if you ever came across I, Omni. I know magazine. of it, but yeah, I don't know much. I, I it didn't was really it. good. Um, cross between sci-fi, but also really decent science, but also just a really weird, wacky magazine. Um, I, there was a lot of stuff in that about consciousness, like what is consciousness and what is this experience that we have? And I, and I think then to read something like Carlos Castaneda just kind of set my mind really. It was like, oh, my God, what the hell is going on here? Um, and the last section of the book is, is about Solosomy Mexicana. And I was just like, you is know, it? I read that book, but I don't remember that. Ah, yeah. It's really weird, though, because the whole method that he, he discusses is like he's essentially like snorting it as a powder. Oh. And it's just like he's so wrong. Um, but Castaneda was making all this stuff up anyway. So it's like, fine. OK, whatever. Um, but it's a great story nonetheless. Um, so, look, of course, I kind of got curious. I got interested, um, you know, and then. Heading on later into, you know, later teenage years, I discovered cannabis. Um, and then I kind of went to a weird high school. And in that, they had a really good selection of, of psychoactive theme books, including Timothy Leary's Psychedelic Experience. And so I kind of read that. And then uh, at some point, we were like, what, what is this, you know? So me and my peers, and then we ended up finding Solosomy Severiginosa. Um, it was one of those things more, it found us. <laughs> we found it. And that Wait, was what do you mean of... it found you? What what do you mean by that? Um well like you didn't actually go look for it, you just happened to one day you just got that lucky and it was just right there. It's just right wow. there. All right, it was meant to be, Kane. It was, it was meant, meant to, be. to be. Yes. It's like we we did go off looking for them, didn't mm-hmm. find them, found a bunch of poisonous ones, and you know, and that's that's an aspect in itself. It's just mm-hmm. like you find these, it's like, oh, we really need to learn how to ID mushrooms. Yeah. So that was also a little bit of a thing that came out during this very this time period was really wanting to learn about mushrooms. And then yeah just hanging out in the field and then, oh, what are those? Oh, my God. <laughs> Could it They're be? Ones. Could <laughs> nice. it be? That's um, that really just kind of then, I think, set the direction for the rest of my life was this experience is incredible. It really opens you up to life, to I think an appreciation of your mortality, an appreciation of experiencing just it's just all the experiences are there. Um, I don't know. 
it's it, like it's a hard thing to describe in, some, yeah. in briefly, isn't it? It's, it can be so many things, but man, the that that scene in the Matrix when Neo gets unplugged and he's just in the pod. I feel like even though that's not quite the right metaphor, I mean, it it takes you out of your standard consciousness and it's like rehacking it. And then you just go, wow, like I'm amazing. And the world is amazing. And oh, my eyes work differently on this drug. How is this possible? Yeah. And yeah, it, it for me, it just, it pulls you a little bit back. You're able to look at yourself and the world differently. So, of course, an epiphanal experience when you're young. Yeah, so that was my experience, was just encountering this mushroom, having this experience, and then it, it just went on from there and, and diving deep into the counterculture and, and dragging up, like, all these books and, and trying to just kind of have an understanding of culturally where psychedelics fit. Um, and then I don't know if you've heard of Joseph Campbell, but... You know, oh, like, yeah, I'm... I worked in Hollywood, dude. I, I worked in development, so I definitely know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, because journey. And he has all these things where he talks about go find your bliss. You know, you go find your bliss, and all the doors will open. And you know, so I definitely kind of took that on board, and and I went and followed my bliss. I went and followed the mushrooms, um, and and ethnobotany. So, um, you know, and at a certain point. I think probably my first year of university, I I stumbled across the genus Psilocybe by Gaston Guzman, read that, and started reading all these other books in in the library. I kind of ignored my studies otherwise, and there was a point which is like, I should just quit this degree. I should quit this degree, do your science degree, and go and become a mycologist. But there was this time of like, well, we're talking real like really early nineties and what do you do with a mycology degree in the early nineties? Um, right. I guess coming from a perspective of like, Oh, going and finding a job. So it's like, Oh, you end up in mushroom farms and doing stuff. And I kind of regret it now. Agricultural stuff, or you, you're studying rusts and things on plants in plants. Rust and mold. Yeah. Plant pathogens. Yeah. They, they, they make it not fun real fast. Really, I mean, mushrooms are bad. Yeah, you're, we're we're hiring you as a mycologist, but really just to protect all our plants. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, great. I ended up getting into IT, and that was really good for me for a while, um, till I kind of started getting really bored with it. <laughs> and you know, like, and I'd been foraging throughout this whole time, but I think there was a certain point where I was out in the forest and I would go off on these walks and, and I stumbled across my old friends again, you know, and after a few years and it was nice to see them and, you know, and then kind of, I don't know, my interest suddenly like burst into flower again, uh, in a, in a deeper way. And, uh, right. We're mature, right? We, we, we get older, we have perspective and then, yep. I, mm -hmm. I had a, roughly similar experience yeah i didn't so, have the same epiphanal experience you did mushrooms were just fun but now i i'm pretty sure i've analyzed this enough to figure out i don't think we ever had enough for all of us to have a big trip experience so we were all sort of had, having a light like euphoric giddy fun little pseudo trip right so yeah i i missed out we got what we could get. We had to take. We there was literally one farmer, who whose son would would sell everybody mushrooms, and you just had to take what you got. And there was always more people than you wanted at the house when you got them. And so, this is how it worked out. I was pretty keen, and I I you know in my local city, I I got to got to know all the spots, uh, and because Solosti spirogonosa is a really potent mushroom, you don't actually need many. You don't mean, need me. I at bet all. you don't <laughs> have a really interesting experience. So we were pretty good. Um, That's great. Well, possibly too good. Yeah, I mean, you probably had a phenomenal first experience. Yeah, like I mean, you said it, but I'm just thinking. Yeah, it probably was pretty special. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people over here, right? Were and we'll get into this a little bit later. 
this is why once you grow cubes and you have the experience of using, you know, many of the different cultigens of cubes, then you start going, but there's other psilocybe out there. There's mm -hmm. other things. I want to see what these feel like. I want to see if they're, you know, I've tried mint chocolate chip ice cream. Let's go try some butter pecan. Let's go try some Rocky Road. Let's let's see what it is what it's all about. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Um, nice. So yeah, so to come back just to finishing the story was essentially then I was out foraging. And I and it kind of it has been a thing in my mind for quite some time. Um, you know, finding different types of of psilocybes. Um, you know, but also different types of other fungi as well. Like Ganod I had a big thing for Ganoderma and um, turkey tails and stuff as well. You know, because I kind of by this point had heard of the medicinal benefits of them. Um, so I kind of developed this interest in like, oh, how do you collect these, and how do you then cultivate them for a conservation perspective, which then took me into the cultivation pathway and it's just like, oh, okay, I have to learn how to learn how to grow mushrooms. So I did. And bam, I was sold. You know, it's just like you start to grow oyster mushrooms on agar and and start to grow other things on agar and it just becomes a thing. I was absolutely done. You know, like and I still get it now. It's just like when I'm plating stuff out and watching the mycelium grow it's like I, this is what i love you it's know, so cool is... i'm with you dude <laughs> <laughs> so with you on that one yes it really Whoa. never gets old there are days where maybe you got too much myco work to do and so you know you're a little bogged down mentally but overall seeing a just a beautiful tub or a bucket or, or a bag of mushrooms it just never gets old yeah absolutely yeah. so after a few years, I got to the point where it's just like, I'm going to quit my career and go back, go to my college. I'm going to do that thing that I had thought about, you know, 15 years earlier. So I did. I just told all my clients, you know, like I was a work from home website developer at this point. Um, I told my clients, I'm going to give you a year. And, and that's what I did. Gave me a year. They all moved their contracts on to someone else and I went to uni and did a science degree. Um, I mean, now that that's is a kind of a bit of a problematic thing in itself because no universities actually do a mycology degree, you know, and even finding mycology units is really, really challenging. So I, I kind of ended up majoring in plant science. I did a lot of microbiology and did chemistry. Um, I mean, yeah, we and... got the same problem over here. You got, it's through the botany department, you know, it's a lot of microbio. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of like, how can I, how can I trick the university into letting me study mycology? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they loved me. Um, I went to an, I went to the University of Tasmania. It's a really lovely small university. Um, you know, you get to know your lecturers really well. You know, you're not like an anonymous face in amongst, like I've also been to the University of Melbourne and that was a completely different experience in that sense. So I was lucky in that I had a really nice intimate university experience, got to know my lecturers and they, they loved it. They loved the fact it's like, oh, here's this mature dude and he really wants to get into mushrooms and they helped me. They recommended just do this, do that. Um, and in the end, I ended up, so we in Australia have an add-on part to our degree. So you graduate from your degree and then they will offer you like a project, um, like we refer to as an honours project. Um, so I did my honours project in mycorrhizal fungi. Um, okay. For reasons. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess because it was part of that cultivation thing was... I was really interested in uh, morels and puccinis and stuff like that. And it's just like, oh, wh what's this trigger? What's, you know, is, is there a way we can work out some way of diverting, at least in morels, 
away from. You're like, I have to do this big project. Okay, fine. I'm going to crack the nut. I'm going to figure out how to grow some of these things by studying them. Yeah, yeah um, that's cool. But I ended up in the different type of mycorrhizal, the one that just essentially forms. Uh, so 80% of all plants form a mycorrhizal relationship with a fungus. Mm -hmm. And it's like this moment of realizing it's just like, oh my God, the world is controlled by fungus. <laughs> you know, it's just like everything has essentially evolved around the fact that plants need to form a symbiotic relationship with fungi to get all their nutrients, to be able to grow. And then, you know, millions and millions of years later, here we are. I, I mean, I think that's why metaphorically, Fungus is making such a, I don't even, I can't say comeback because they never had a moment before really, but, but a renaissance or whatever you want to call it, because metaphorically speaking, right, we grew up in most educational systems learning about plants and animals, and the science was skewed so heavily in that direction for economic reasons, for agricultural reasons, you know, just to feed the populace. But then now, right, we're in a postmodern world. We want to get to the bottom of things. We want the deeper understanding. And I feel like fungus is this perfect metaphor of that. Like once you once you understand fungus, then you really get it. That was just, yeah, another epiphany. And, and I guess I then went on from my honors project to then uh, do my master's degree. Uh, which is then where the conservation mycology stuff kind of really kicked in. Um, and this was kind of more in an informational sense of looking at looking at how we record data. Now, I, I assume most of your listeners are familiar with iNaturalist, um, you know, but that's that's still a fairly recent kind of appearance on the scene. And I, here in Australia, we had a project called Fungi Map that was set up by Dr. Tom May, and because um, he was kind of one of these kind of forerunners of like, well, how do we track fungi? How do we find out where they're growing? Um, and it was kind of like during that period of where fungi were essentially being ignored. And I think we can come back to a little bit of mycophobia in the sense of just like. Uh, you know, and, and I got it from actually a couple of lecturers at uni of just like, oh, this fungus, they're just another, you know, we had to shift them out of the plant science department, you know. Really? So it. there were hate, there were fungi haters? No, not fungi haters, but just dismissive of like, well, oh. they're not part of our group anymore. They're I over see. there. I see. You know, like, and then you, I guess you've got the ag science group who were just kind of like a little bit more of, you know, they kind of fit in ag science, but they kind of don't. And then they kind of fit into microbiology, but they kind of don't. You know, like one of the units I did to study fungi during university, my science degree was um, plant pathogens, you know, and it was still kind of like an afterthought. It was just like, oh, yeah, but they're not just a pathogen. It's like we can also grow truffles or, you know, this or that. And that was the, probably the extent of talking about fungi from a cultivation perspective of like, oh, we can grow truffles. <laughs> right. Because yeah. there's so much money involved and yada, yada. So, um, what was I talking about? Conservation mycology. This awareness that, that fungi were kind of being ignored, that there was not a lot of, there were, there were very few mycologists um, I know like a lot of universities in the States in America have mycologists and probably a little bit more. Oh, yeah. We don't have anywhere like that in Australia, you know, like mycology in Australia was very much ignored. And I, and I do suspect there was a cultural thing about that, you know, like fungi had been shifted out of some of these science departments. There was no one there to, to kind of grab onto them and hold onto them. There was no real benefits to the university to run mycology classes um so the number of mycologists on the field were very very few and far between i mean um, there's not a lot here really but uh, you're painting a pretty bleak picture that it was just really yeah yeah it was sad um and so 
like we had a couple of mycologists here who who were pretty dedicated to mycology and uh, and then there were a bunch of citizen scientists as well who were kind of interested as well. And so the Funky Map project was really good here. It helped kind of draw together those people who were interested in fungi and who were interested in learning how to ID them, but also track them. And so people could like take photographs of them, put, draw a dot on a map and, and send this all into the Funky Map project. And they developed this kind of database of of records across Australia. Um, and then that all got handed over at some point to the Atlas of Living Australia. So when I came along to do my master's thesis, that was the data that I was using. It was a lot of the data from the Atlas of Living Australia um, that had come via Fungi Map. So I also volunteered for Fungi Map. Um, and then kind of dove into that data of like, well, how do we how do we how do we track um, a conservation status for a fungus? Um, and I guess this is it was one of those kind of confluence of ideas that had been popping up in a few different places. Uh, and I know there was a couple of researchers in the states who um, had written a paper based on the IUCN red list. Um, list for threatened species there was there was the the IUCN which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, and they have this red list system which is essentially then looking at all species and assessing it for its conservation status um, now that conservation status could be anything from not threatened uh, through to critically endangered, for example, or even in some cases only existing in cultivation, uh, otherwise ex extinct. Uh, so things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now most things, you they're, they're pretty easy to track. You can track a plant. You can track an animal. You know, it's there. It's in a position. You can kind of come back. You can, you know, watch the plant's going to be there or the herd is going to be within the same area. You can sit and count them year in year out to, to see how the population numbers change whether they increase or drop for example but how do you how do you do this for fungi um you know fungi and i guess this is another point is fungi are essentially invisible they're we they exist as mycelium within their within their substrate within their food most of the time you know, they're, they, they're just doing their thing. They just kind of, their mycelial threads are kind of spreading out and consuming their food. But we don't know that they're there until they actually decide, oh, I'm running out of food. I need to produce a mushroom. So there's all these kind of factors about, and I, and I think this is also a lovely thought, is like how lucky are you to actually come across the mushroom when you come across it? You know, it's like this one hundred yes moment of yes. the mushroom has decided I need to reproduce, I need to sporulate. So it grows this beautiful mushroom. It's there maybe for a week, maybe two weeks, and then it just rots away. And you know, like, and if you don't come across it within that two week period of its being there, you miss it. Right. That's what I'm thinking right now. Every morel that's sitting in the woods that I'm not picking is going to be just just fall into nothingness and i missed a chance to get it i know mm -hmm. but it's that's its life cycle right um right. so um yeah, yeah. but it, but it is it's this thing of like you how yeah. lucky are you to come across it and so there's this whole thing about like well okay how do you track mushrooms how do you know that they're there and and this is what I love about this whole iNaturalist project is, you know, go out and make an observation, um, you know. But I guess there's a point there I'll come back to later. Um, but there's this beautiful paper by, by Anders Dahlberg and Gregory Mueller um, applying ICN red listing criteria for assessing and reporting on the conservation status of fungal species. It's a really good paper and I highly recommend. And I guess it kind of got a lot of other people thinking, you know, and there's a, there's a beautiful paper by 
uh, Alison Puglio and Tom May called The Third F that I also highly recommend reading. And I kind of then, like in 2018, there was a beautiful paper uh, recognising uh, conservation mycology as a field um, by Tom May, Jerry Cooper, um, Dahlberg, Mueller, Julio, uh, and a few others, you know. Um, and what year was that? Do you remember? That was 2018 that that paper 2018. came out. And that, that was not, not that long ago. No, not that long ago yeah. at all. Um, I think this is important. This this is a, a really important, and this is why what you're doing is so important, and why iNaturalist is so important, and why some of our guys over here, like Stephen Russell, that that bought themselves a nanopore device, and now has a couple other guys that are learning how to use it. Right, my buddy Kyle Cannon here in Ohio has one. Um, mm -hmm. Hart Singer's got one, and and so now we're able to do a lot of barcoding on a lot of mushrooms. We're able to track and figure out life cycles, right? Like how often do these boletes pop up over here in, in in you know the side of this trail? How many years? Oh, look, and I and I think that's a really important point too that I kind of alluded to a moment ago is that you know you can go out. And you can find a mushroom and you can put a pin on an iNaturalist. But I think one of the important things is to also come back, say, a year later and make another pin. You know, it's just like just because there's a pin there already, it doesn't mean you can, you don't, you, you, yep. you can't put another pin in exactly the same place. Right. Or just because you did an observation on Lion's Mane this year doesn't mean if you find it again, you can't do another one like yeah no exactly you really can do observe all things right yes. like there is a benefit to that yes yep so and this was kind of i'm trying to get to my master's project here because i was then looking at the data um and looking at how you then can map out fungi so trying to track population numbers for fungi is, is really difficult I've kind of already alluded to that. So I guess by then having these data points, you can then at least go to the IUCN criteria for geographical distribution. So like it's difficult to track population numbers, but at least if you have a distribution map, you can look at that. Um, huh. So Yeah, it is tricky, right? Because what is it? It's not the mushroom. Mm -hmm. It's all the mycelium. And then mm -hmm. how do you know, how, like how many, you can't go, well, there's a field here and I know the certain kind of mushroom shows up. So that's a species. Now we're, we're identifying it by its fruiting bodies, mm -hmm. but it, the real organisms just under the ground. Well, how, what do you go? There's one thing there, like one living thing, even though it produces a thousand mushrooms every year so i mean on every level it's hard it's complicated and messy and how do you do it yeah yeah no so my thesis was essentially just writing a whole bunch of code to then look at and i essentially did every single species in australia <laughs> every wow. single fungus species in australia so how, what just, was that how many are we talking about? oh oh god now thousands going on the spot yeah it was thousands oh my gosh okay Wow. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Probably the vast majority of those species couldn't actually be assessed because there was less than three points. One of the big problems with geog doing things geographically is you need a minimum of a triangle. You need at least three points for a species to then be able to go, oh, well, that's its area of extent. I see. So there was a whole bunch of species I just kind of I could not even look at because because there was only two points or one point for this particular species. Yeah, so we just I mean we don't know anything, so we got to start somewhere. And so that's cool. You did these maps because quite honestly, that's probably the best way, right? What other it, way really is, is there? There's yeah. no other way. It's only by more and more people observing more and more mushrooms and evidence mm -hmm. of the stuff that you get any sense of that. So that's, yeah. I like that, dude. That's cool. 
So, and now you were doing, were you doing that before INAT came out? Oh, no, I was, this was definitely after INAT. Like okay, I was essentially, okay. you, um, but INAT hadn't really taken off the way I think it I has okay. in the meantime. So I was doing this in 2018 um, and then I finished my thesis in 2019. Okay. Um, one of the big takeaways was essentially that because fungi cover such a big area, it's then hard to use the ICN criteria to then determine if it's threatened because they have like all these cutoffs for, for an area. And a lot of the fungi that I was, was looking at uh, was that the area, even for like some of the things that had only like three points or five points, tended to exceed that criteria for, which was a bummer. So it's kind of like um, fungi kind of break those rules when it comes to working out their, the IUCN uh, criteria. Yeah, they so, like need their own uh, rule because it's so different. Yes. Yep. I, yeah. 100%. Totally. Um, for some things, you can refer to back to the, the host species. So like some things only grow on like a particular tree. So you can then use the tree um, as kind of like a reference point. Um, so like, I mean, you know, like death caps are, tend to only grow in association with a few trees like oaks or something. Um, death caps are, I think, not threatened, but... Um, you know, but if you we are have... threatened by them, but they're not threatened by <laughs> us. No. no, definitely not. <laughs> um, you know, so if you have a fungus that grows on a tree that's critically endangered, well, and it only grows on that tree, then you've got a fairly good means of saying, well, then that fungus is also right, critically. That endangered. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. one uh, the other thing well, you've got a few proxies that you can probably work with. Yeah, it's a tricky thing. I mean, you would assume that if it's well observed, then you have a sense of where it's at. But some of these things that are harder to fruit, like it doesn't necessarily mean that just because there's less of a preponderance of fruit that it's not there in the ground. Mm. You you don't necessarily know that. So yeah, it's tricky, man. That's and of course, lucky you had a bit of a background in coding and all that stuff. So you could bring that to the table and actually Pretty figure awesome. some stuff out. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. No, I, it, it, the, the project just kind of came up and it was just like, Oh yeah, this sounds, this sounds amazing. I'm yeah. Love to dive into this and do this. And um, it was, it was a good project. So, now when is INAT going to hire you? to improve uh, upon all of their coding for distribution <laughs> maps and and yes guys hey i naturalist people if you're listening i can put you in touch with this guy he's got an instagram yes because people are really using right i i think inat started out to be a more casual type of thing like to get people into going outside and looking at nature and now you got guys they got the ITS barcode and data in there they're they're really hacking that thing to be super functional i mean i i would love to see some kind of conglomeration of inat and like genbank you know like where you 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 do have a lot more scope with metadata of that's associated with fungi you know and it's kind of like a thing i've been doing a lot lately is is going through INAT and finding like a lot of the ITS sequences that people are putting oh, yeah. up. And then they're there. They're there. I wish you could search them. I, I wish there was a way of searching them. I think, I think Stephen Russell mentioned that there's like sort of a backwards way of kind of doing it, but yeah, it's you can't not... do it. Yeah. No, there's a, you there's can, a, oh, you can. Okay. There is a URL that you can punch in and you, you can hack the URL a little oh, bit. Okay. So, okay. I mean, I'm happy to share with you the URL I use. So, oh, um, well, well that, know, that'll be another, you... we'll do that episode. That's the how to hack INET with Kane Barlow. We will do that once. Oh, yeah. I guess. oh it's, yeah. it's really not that complicated. It's, it's, 
just the URL and and the way they code it somehow with their um with the JavaScript it it kind of maintains that ITS oh, searchability okay. and also being able to search for a species at the same time. So I see, um, which is nice. Yeah, I love it. it. I mean, it helps me learn first of all, I, so I can both document you know what I'm observing and I put it in there. And if I can't identify it, you know, off the top of my head, or if it's not pretty easy to ID, it's there for me waiting. It's a project mm -hmm. I can, you know, deal with at another time. So it's cool. I was just going to finish off, but I think one of the benefits of the fact that INAT's been just so well used in the time period is, is we're probably now at a position where we can actually start to go and look at how distributions are starting to change over time of, you know, like uh, is the distribution for some species dis growing smaller or is it growing bigger? Um, you know, and I guess there's probably limits at where we ha kind of have to have like a, um, a point at which we go, oh, well, there's a consistent level of observation for this species every year now. So we can be certain about that. But um, yeah, yeah, no. Things in All we got to do is get everybody doing INAP. Yeah. We got to get everybody doing it. The more, the, more data. And the don't better. be afraid to make records, you know, yeah. like don't be afraid to put the same record that maybe someone made like a week ago, you know, like oh, if yeah. that mushroom is still there a week later, that's still interesting information. Agree. You know, and there's more you can do on top of that as well, you know, like with other species species mapping technologies so yeah. yeah yeah i one of my favorite things is you can pull up a certain species you can define it by a region and you literally get a graph of the you know where the density of observations are highest so mm -hmm. you're like oh cool okay so here's when when we find you know yellow morels in the state of ohio here is the the peak is you know the last week in April. All right, cool. Like it, it gives you that's really useful information. That's not folklore. That's not some old guy saying, yeah, it's right after the crows leave the the tree. <laughs> and you know, it's it's not it's it's literal data points going. Here is when most people observe this mushroom historically over time. That's it's a it's really, a beautiful thing. Yeah, man, it's cool information. If you like mushrooms and, and you got a bucket list, right? You got a bucket list of, I haven't found these 10 mushrooms yet. That's some useful information right there. When to look for them, where to look for them. Yep. I love it. All right, so do this. The, sorry, I started to interrupt you a little bit, only because I, wanna, I want our viewers to understand why, especially in Australia, what you're doing is so important, right? We're not, this isn't North South America land bridge. This is an island in the middle of the ocean separated by thousands and thousands of miles from other large continents. You guys got some really unique stuff over there, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, between Australia and New Zealand, there's some really, really funky, funky. <laughs> So, and and as you're saying and no one's paying attention to them mm -hmm. so here you are yep. paying attention to them that's great i love it mm -hmm. um yeah i learned a word looking uh kind of looking up some of the stuff i'd never actually heard the term end and end endemism like endemism. The, the yes. endemism yeah the yeah i didn't realize that you, you know that this is actually something scientists pay attention to. Like, oh, this place is really special. We should pay attention to it. And then you're sitting here telling me, but even though they know that, they're not paying attention to the mushrooms. They're not paying attention so much. Well, they are now. I think this is a beautiful thing that I've certainly seen like in the last oh, 10, but even the last five years is, is the, the attention to fungi has just suddenly, dare I say it, mushroom <laughs> it's just mushroom <laughs> it's no like you could go into a bookshop five years ago and probably you'd be lucky to find one one field guide they'd stock the field guide just because um, we probably better have 
the one field guide or two if you're lucky. But now I can go into a bookshop and there's like 10 books on mushrooms. You know, like it, it, it's for me, that is a clear indicator of just the, the, the cultural fascination for fungi. And I think also part of that has been driven by the fascination with psychoactives. I think either ed foraging for edibles or it's the psychoactives is what draw people in, those two key things. And, you know, and I think, you know, we've got, we've had people like Paul Stamets and, you know, like he kind of flirted around the idea for a while and he suddenly out. It's just like, oh, yeah, you know, like that was a big thing and. So. He he told a great story, right? I mean, the that TED talk of his is oh, yeah. a great TED talk. It gets, I mean, if I don't care how many times you watched it, I'll watch it again with friends who I'm like, yo, you got to watch this TED talk, and then I watch it yeah. with them. And it yeah. still gets me excited. I mean, I probably watched it a hundred times, and it still <laughs> still gets me pretty I've amped up. That many times, but it's definitely a good. It's a good. Yeah, clip. It's, yeah. it's it's it's. It, it gets you going. And mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. You said that I think I've sort of, I don't know, maybe I just have a desire to think it's this broader interest. You're probably right. It, I mean, really the Renaissance right now, it's the psychedelic Renaissance and that is bringing forth a growing interest in, in fungi in general. Yeah. That, that it's yeah. now I've, I've been moderating uh, you know, like Facebook fungi groups for a long time. You know, like I was a trusted identifier on Shroomery and then I kind of moved over onto uh, Facebook and was just kind of helping people ID their mushrooms. And there was a certain point, and this is psychoactive fungi, um, there was a certain point at which it stopped being just people in their probably their 20s and 30s to suddenly being older people who were looking for mushrooms for their therapeutic benefits. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm also kind of, in, I'm heavily involved with Entheogenesis Australis as well. So we've also kind of been able to kind of get this sense of this really rapidly evolving interest in, in the therapeutic benefits of, of not just mushrooms, but all psychoactive kind of, um, or psychedelics, you know, at least the classic psychedelics. Um, but there's all these other plants and all these other ethnobotanicals that, that are also part of that kind of sphere of interest. Of, you know, like there's a lot of talk about blue lotus at the moment or um, canna, you know, selidium tortuosum and, and, and other things. But because I think psilocybin doesn't have the same kind of scare thing that lsd has it, it's been a little bit more accepted by people um and it it's certainly from my perspective it's definitely leading the charge and and people are fascinated you know like wow so i, I can go and pick this mushroom for and use it to to treat my mental health I don't have I don't have to go to the drugstore. I don't need a prescription. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's possibly sitting just in the woods behind my house. Yep. Love it. Mm -hmm. Mind you, there are some caveats around that. <laughs> you know, like um, you know, like there's a lot of harm reduction stuff, like, you know, have a sitter and and you know, work your way up. Don't just dive in. Um uh, yeah, you know, the youngsters. Time, be careful. Maybe microdose first before you really, yeah, take the big steps. Yeah, we. So I work in an ER. I haven't seen a huge uptick, but I would say there's a slight but noticeable uptick in interest in both foraging for edible mushrooms. We, I mean, we really only have one, maybe two psychedelic mushrooms that people are likely to find where i'm at so that's not so much a problem but um there's definitely more recently been an interest in getting out in the woods it you want to know who it is it's usually younger people are the yeah. ones that are not cautious are not thinking it all the way through um, 
Mm-hmm. You just go, oh, orange mushroom, cool, chanterelle, eat it. Nope, it was a jack lantern. Whoops. <laughs> now you're vomiting violently for for a day. Which then leads to, you know, like, so certainly here where I am in Southeast Australia, uh, we have a few species that are of interest. So there's Solospis aeruginosa, um, which I think some of your your viewers are probably aware of because I know people are, are now cultivating it in, in the States and other parts of the world. Um, because they're fascinated by it. It's, it's this species that's endemic to Australia uh, and supposedly very, very potent. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. And it also has a bit of a thing where it defeats traditional cultivation methods. It's, it's very, very difficult to grow indoors. So most people grow it outdoors in garden beds. Um, you know, and that's kind of where a lot of people, certainly where I am in kind of in urban Melbourne, tend to go foraging is is for wood chip beds in local parks and whatnot. And um, yeah, Picking and who knows if they're there naturally or if somebody, you know, inoculated. Ah, uh, we know pretty certain now that they're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they're definitely natural, but um, but they are definitely an adventitious species. They um. Yeah. Will they will happily spread into a pile of wood chips and and will grow, right. and it's kind of it's interesting looking at how they 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 grow differently in in a natural environment to what they do in a, in a wood chip bed, um, you know in the forest when you're foraging for them, you know they tend to grow kind of singly and you know maybe little clumps of one or two, you know so you can spend like a whole day just kind of wandering over a really wide area, um, whereas you get these wood chip beds, and and I'm sure some people have seen the photos of them. Of it's just a carpet of of mushrooms. You know what might take a whole day. You know you you can pick within probably an hour. Otherwise, right. Yeah. Let me um let me just for people who don't know, let's let's pull up. Yeah, let's pull up some photos, <laughs> images here, and then you can show me what you're talking about now. So. This is kind of what I'm guessing you mean by a nice little wood chip bed. I mean, I can't Absolutely. entirely tell where this is, but it doesn't seem like it's in the middle of nowhere in a, in the forest. That looks and like look a at that wall there on the right hand side. Oh, you're right. Yeah, maybe a little bit of a garden edge. Oh no, it looks like a bit of grass. I was going to say maybe it's a bit and of then... edging on the left hand side. But you definitely can see... landscaping. Yeah, and, and wood. This chip. is landscaped. This is wood chip mold. Um, it's hard to tell if this is uh, someone's home cultivation, but this could quite easily be like a, a council wood chip bed right. in in the park somewhere. Yep, and then contrast that with maybe some of these photos that seem like they're probably in the woods. Yep, just a couple fruit. Yeah, just a couple. Yeah, you can see they're a little bit more slightly separated and that look at that yes, they have a beautiful, beautiful cortina man oh it is it's that Lovely. part that that web webby partial veil yeah um yep yeah. yeah they're they are absolutely beautiful. nice little wavy caps it's a pretty fruit one of the most potent now here here's a little cluster of them but this definitely looks like maybe somebody did a, a bit of urban farming here. I reckon that's urban farming. Yeah. They just kind of photographed it at night time with a little bit or, or it's just really shaded. Yeah. Yeah. Another beautiful cluster. Nice specimen. But they're such a lovely mushroom. Yeah. You know, they've just got this beautiful, thick, fibrous white stem and, you know, and, and the, and I guess, you know, like I kind of alluded to it earlier on, but they have all these different phenotypes. You know, you'll have types that, um, you know, kind of have that kind of, kind of droopy, saggy kind of cap, but then sometimes right. they're, um, you know, really kind of smooth and, and just have a really nice kind of umbo. And there's one there that's being held on the left-hand side. 
Not that one. Okay, hold on. Here? Uh, go up a bit. I think it's the second from the top. Oh, that's a nice oh. handful too. Yeah. Oh, this one. This one. Okay. And, with this, and, you know, some of them even have like this undulating kind of yep. margin. But but you can see there's just that beautiful white stem and and the color is just gorgeous. Yeah, the I like the that's kind of my probably the most attractive. I think that's what most me. people probably recognize more as a as a sub. It's a slightly triangular kind of shaped cap. Yeah. So yeah, I'm also I mean, I'm probably wrong, but the wood chip ones versus these guys almost seem slightly different coloration. Mm -hmm. Ah, but this see that's the trick though of of the hygrophonous cap as that's well. True. Yeah, who knows? And the moisture right. levels. Um, right. You know, like I've seen Siberiganosa from you know like almost like a chocolate brown color mm -hmm. through to uh, like I had a patch at the University of Tasmania that I kept finding that the caps which is completely white. Like it was only because I'd noticed the stems that I suddenly mm. realized it's just like, oh, oh my God, that's this subs. <laughs> Sitting right next to the cafeteria. It was a it was a terrific little spot. Man. And then yeah, that Cortina, the room. I know, Cortina man. That's, that's yeah, and just... there's the, that brown color in one sample there. Where where you oh, right here. The second row from the bottom. Okay. Oh, here you. Oh, go. that's see, that's another one as well. Yeah. Almost has that jelly sub appearance. You're right. Yeah. You know, and there was a, there was a point in time where you know, like I was, you know, going from patch to patch to patch to patch, and. I was seeing all these differences between, you know, a patch behind the mountain, this one side of the mountain and that side of the mountain and got really interested in terms of, you know, is this really just one species? Oh my God. Yeah. No, that is fully like almost jelly sub. <laughs> yeah. That might, might be that, that whole, you know, just the, the droopy kind of undulating. Right. Kind of look, although that has a really pronounced umbo on it as well. Yeah, see, guys, if you're not on iNaturalist, this is what's so great about this site is look at all these photos. You can you can yeah. just quickly gain a bit of a deeper understanding. It helps you when you're out in the woods trying to figure out what you got. It's great. This is kind of I think in my head the classic look that if i'm ever doing an outdoor grad bed this is kind of what i'm dreaming of having mm -hmm. is the nice wavy caps yeah but then look at like this doesn't look like almost anything else on this page oh that's a nice specimen right like that one in the back is totally lacking its umbo like it's fully dropped oh i know yeah what is that all about <laughs> But these things are they they do have an incredible yeah. variation and there was a yeah. period of time where i was really really curious about like what is with all the phenotypes why is it that they vary so widely you know even within a small area yeah are we looking at one species or are we looking at multiple species look at that um, good old alan rockefeller is just good for some really well thought out photos uh, he does. Yeah. Here you get some UV. You really, all the identifying features of the lamellae, you, you got a good view of the stipe. Uh, yeah. he, you know, he's got his KOH on hand. He's he's doing everybody a lot of favors here. Yeah, he really is. Nice stuff. Yeah, he has some really beautiful photos. So now, uh, tell me this. How, what what is the distribution like for this in Australia? Massive. So the distribution for Psilocybe siberiginosa, um, the southernmost find is on Matsika Island, which is like this really remote little island off the coast, southern coast of Tasmania. Um, the most northern finds are in southeast Queensland. Uh, 
Actually, no, it was, oh, I think one of Alistair's finds in uh, the Banya, the Banya Mountains was probably one of the more northern finds. Um, and then it also grows in South Australia down through, so uh, what are you pulling up? Ah, uh, here we are. Yeah. Just a little visual prop here. Yeah, no, the visual helps here. Um, so, yeah, you can see it covers pretty well most of Tasmania, um, Victoria, yeah. South Australia, right up the eastern coast. Yep, so all over Tasmania, yep. And really... The eastern coast to southeast Queensland. Brisbane. Uh, and then... New Zealand. Growth okay. in New Zealand as well. Uh, and it does occur in southwest um, WA, but we suspect it's an introduced species in southwest WA. Although uh, there were some records found on bio platforms, uh, one of the kind of um, soil DNA mapping sites that we have here in Australia that possibly found uh, an endemic population mm. of Sparaginosa in WA. So there may be a mix happening there that we don't know about. But that's, and I guess this is the thing, this is the importance, though, of then um, doing genomic sequencing as well. Of the Like the, yeah, the full. Yeah. You want to see the whole genome, yes. Mm -hmm. Really figure some um, stuff out. Yeah. I mean, we're pretty lucky now that we've had um, Alistair McTaggart, you know, and, um, you know, he, he got his permit to be able to collect specimens and then do the genomic work. And I know you've, like the Cabensis paper that you've mentioned, uh, but the, he's also been doing work on Seberogonosa as well. Uh, and there is a preprint available. Um, that demonstrates that uh, Seberogonosa is one whole population. Uh, it just has an incredible amount of phenotypic variation. Uh, and it seems to be also that from his work, uh, it looks like Psilocybe cyanesins and Psilocybe azuresins are likely conspecific. So they're the same species. That's not... That lines up with something several people have been talking about. So that that's interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, right? It's hard to figure out some of these things. It's the same thing, right? But it looks at a bunch of different ways. All those things, all those cards get laid out on the table if you start looking at the genome. So that's mm -hmm. that's cool that he's doing that work and figuring some of that stuff out. You guys are doing a lot of good stuff, figuring a lot of stuff out setting a good example for you know people everywhere like mm -hmm. start in your 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 town your 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 area wherever you live and figure it out mm. do, do some work care about it no so it's it's lovely to actually see that and it, and so i met alistair through him having gotten his permit and then he got pointed in my direction and he and I got talking about then me helping him with his project do his PhD but again it came back to this whole thing about funding arrangements uh, whether the university actually takes any interest in the project uh, and they kind of didn't so the PhD project with Alistair never happened which was a little disappointing but so but he's, you guys are still doing cool stuff, still figuring stuff out. So mm -hmm. where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. I, I just remember yep. seeing one of his videos and he was talking about how he got his, all, all his permits and all that. But he has like a certain number of plates, right, that he can have at any given time. And so he's like, it's like always shuffling how to manage and stay within those parameters. And I, I was like, you're, you're doing God's work. Yep. Brother, super, like super super challenging. Yeah, it's really challenging. Um, like giving you permission, right? It's like giving you a lollipop and going, but you only get to suck on it for five minutes, and then you gotta. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. No, the Schedule Nine license is very very. Oh, so Schedule Nine is the Australian equivalent to Schedule One, 
or or class A. So, um, so getting a Schedule Nine license has a lot of restrictions like that. Um, you know, like double locked doors and you know background checks and oh yeah. And um, I imagine you know, disposal is a whole deal, right? Exactly. You're I only mean... allowed to have X amount of stuff at any given time, so you have to kind of calculate what's the psilocybin being produced mm. and, and stuff like that. So, fun, um, fun, fun. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing like, yes, you can do some science, but you have to do it handcuffed, blindfolded, and wearing a straight jacket. Yeah. No, and this is why psilocybe is such a fascinating genus is because of all of the legal restrictions that happen around it it's just been so thoroughly ignored um and you know and i and i guess i think you know like alan and and hart um and i think like the entheome foundation as well you know are really helping with projects oh who else is doing that nobody else being able to actually i identify new species and yep. then go ahead and do the ITS sequences or the genomic work to then just go, yep, this is this is a brand new species. Um, you know, Man, it's, it... it's a fascinating time. And oh, and I think who else? Someone recently published uh is it Nibio? Oh, oh Nibio Tropicalis, yeah, Scott Astuni and and yep. yep. Yep, the homies. You know, yep. So it's it's like all of a sudden these these new these species that have been there for ages are being identified, and we can we can quantify that with with genetic work and go, yep, bam, new species. Isn't it funny how you think? Well, I mean, science it's been around. We've figured all this stuff out. Right now, we're trying to go to Mars. We couldn't have missed mushrooms in our backyard, could we? And yet no, we are. <laughs> we are absolutely <laughs> doing that. Yes. Yeah. So yep. no, and and this has kind of been an interesting thing here in Australia. Is like, you know, like okay, we've got Psilocybe subaruginosa. Thanks to Alistair, we can just go. Yeah, it is all one species. But there are other species popping up. There are other things that people are finding. Um, you know, like we have Psilocybe elodicea. That was described only like in 2006. Um, although we we now suspect that Psilocybe elodicea is actually the original Psilocybe tasmaniana, but we need to get someone to sequence the original Psilocybe tasmaniana that was collected, and that's that's sitting in a herbarium in Edinburgh in Scotland. All right, so, so here's the elodicea. Mm-hmm up some pictures of it i had actually never heard of this one but i mean yeah. there's what 200 it strongly resembles uh the conica coprophylla so it's it kind of gets ignored i think by most people because all right but it's part of section semilanciata oh it is okay yeah so it's, it kind of resembles Libby Caps in some situation. Mm -hmm. The, But you oh, can see yeah. it's definitely got that psilocybe kind of style stem mm -hmm. and beautiful kind of hygrophonous cap, like coloring. Yeah. And that striated margin is just... Yeah, I was going to say because I'm looking, I'm looking at that one versus the striations on that one. That's I don't that's know if a that... moist, that's a moist cap. The other one was I a see. dried cap. Okay. Hmm. No, and and this is the importance that that hygrophonous kind of cap. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you see the yeah, striations and the remnants of the the partial veil even in that one. Oh, yep. So that's this one is more like the stature of like a little pan cyan. It's a it's a small much smaller. Oh, it's probably even smaller. They can oh. get bigger. Yeah, they can get to. I mean, I've seen some big pan cyans, but mm -hmm. um, these can be kind of quite small to, to yeah, quite tall. 
And do you, do you know about um, potency on these? Um, I think it's a bit mixed. Uh, I know some people have gone, yeah, it was kind of reasonable. Uh, some people just go, man, it's not really worth it. So. What is that? Oh, the print. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's really purple. Yeah, look at the purple coming through in that. I mean, that's not like... To the, on the left, it's more like the purple red, purple brown, but boy, on that right, that's really purple. Whoever took who was that? Can you? Uh, the golden, see. the golden forest wizard. Shout out to the golden <laughs> forest wizard. <laughs> we were good. just talking about this earlier. <laughs> Shout out to you, dude. That's a that that is an awesome the, photograph. The real cool picture right there. Yes, that is book worthy. That is nice. It's absolutely book worthy. And they've they've just got the lighting just right to, to really highlight the purple. Yeah. Now hopefully it's not just a, a like a doctored photo, but I, I I'm I'm hopefully it's not. Because mm -hmm. that looks very cool. All right. So that's um and then you said that's closely related. Let me switch this here so we can get through some of these other. Oh, so because there's been a bit of a thing. <laughs> about Psilocybe Tasmaniana. Uh, Psilocybe Tasmaniana was originally collected by uh, by Watling in the 70s um, and was then described by Guzman and Watling. Um, I think it turned up again in a paper by Chang and Mills in 1992, which when they made Psilocybe Sibiriginosa synonymous with Psilocybe australiana and Psilocybe eucalypta, and they tried to include Tasmaniana in it. Uh, but then Johnson and Buchanan in New Zealand in 1996 then removed Tasmaniana. So it's, it's but the thing is, it's just like, well, I know I've certainly been out there and I know a couple of other people who've been out in Tasmania trying to find Tasmaniana and no one's ever found it. Um, but we're finding a Ludicea. And by comparing the two descriptions, it, they compare very, very closely. That we feel that maybe a Ludicea was actually Psilocybe Tasmaniana and we just kind of have to do the genetic work at which point the two will just become synonymous. What we're looking at, um, it somehow got confused and there's now a whole bunch of species. There's a new species that's not yet been named or described uh, that people are referring to as Psilocybe Tasmaniana. So, so they're going to they're gonna move that name over. They're so not going to get... Right? They're like, we at, like the yeah. name. We, yeah. Is is whatever those are in those photographs that you just showed? Uh, they're all going to have to be called something else. I see. Because yeah, these look very similar. I know they look a little bit bigger, though, huh? I don't know. Uh, still, section similanciata. Yep. Yeah, this is where it gets people are finding guide. them in pots and um yeah look at that at which point they start to take on a different morphology that's like the wood chip morphology mm -hmm. a little bit down and dirty yeah but they have kind of like this cell lanceata tile type and um this kind of beautiful cap it has kind of like uh it has a little bit of an umbo when it's young but that kind of then kind of disappears but one of the okay. distinguishing features is that the stem kind of leads up into the cap let me see if i got one of those oh uh, yeah like... the best. no okay no it's not the best example Probably the one next to it, maybe. Oh, hold on. But you can see it in some angles of like. It's kind of like a slightly upward lift up into the cap. 
the the gill structure you mean I'm trying to um i can find the right photo i think that's probably a little bit hard that one because the gills look a little bit broken let me see down on that middle row oh actually maybe even there on the right hand side there's a group a group shot mm, left hand here? side sorry oh left side <laughs> This one, possibly, yeah. You can see it. You can see it there in those middle long three, where okay. the stem is kind of it, it's it's slightly angling up into into the cap. Oh, you mean like the stipe bends? The stipe bends up into the oh, cap. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, I see that. You're right. Mm. At least in the, the taller fruit, do that. Yeah, interesting. All right, so again, but like this, this, anybody this want thing. a PhD? Here you go. <laughs> Plenty of work to be done here, right? Yeah, it's an abs It's a lovely species. Um, but people have only really started noticing it, like in the last the last few years. Right now, that's like the the that's like the. The plain girl that, you know, senior year of high school, now everybody's paying attention to her, right? Now there's a little bit more of a reason to start looking at all these brown mushrooms on the ground and going, oh, what do we got here? So those are really common in wood chip beds in New Zealand. Uh, and we're starting to find them here in, in Australia uh, in kind of really grassy environments. So, which which kind of fits for section similanciata, um, uh, and I think people are also finding them now in the pots in in Australia as well. Do you think those are all of a sudden showing up in the pots? You think that's a human intervention? Do you think like people are doing beds and it's getting around, or what is that all about? Oh, I think things just it's either someone just having a bit of fun out the back of some um, nursery somewhere or yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen it with Siberiganosa as well, you know, where they'll, they'll grow up in, you know, like if you use like a really rich woody mulch for your potting mix, um, sometimes the subs get in there and, and will just grow through and, and pop out the bottom or pop out the top. But I think Tasmaniana and a couple of others, really love that decomposing kind of pine mulch and will just happily grow through it. So, you know, it's gotten into some mulch pile somewhere, probably in a distribution center and it's just growing through and up it pops. That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm. All right. I'm, I'm looking through here. Uh, what one to do next you want to do, um, since we've been talking about Liberty, Liberty caps a little bit, should we do that next? Yeah, sure. You guys get these in Pacific Northwest, don't you? And also up in um, Quebec, Newfoundland. Uh, by you guys, I don't. But yes, all the people up there, I, I think these are, you know, not not terribly hard to find. Um, I didn't know about Quebec, though. May, yeah. Yeah. No idea. All right, so uh, on. They are probably an introduced species to to kind of North America, I would think. Um, you know, because like we typically associate these with with the UK, uh, which is where they're better known. But we get them here in Australia as well. So, you know, and after the like the last, yeah, you can see that separable uh, gelatinous pellicle in that. Oh yeah. Go back. Not so much in that one, but go back a slide. This one or yeah, further? Yeah, there yeah, you can yeah, see that. Uh, yeah. There it is. Yeah, they are just a beautiful mushroom. They're kind of restricted in Australia. Um, they grow in Tasmania and, and Alpine Victoria. They're, they're a beautiful thing. Oh, yeah. Really long. Uh, now, yeah, yeah, they are because yeah. they, they have to. Well, they, they grow on decomposing grass. So they're competing so, um, with, yeah, they're trying to like they compete, make their way. You know, like if you've got like a really high field or a pasture, 
the, right. the mushrooms are trying to grow up above the grass. Ooh. But you can see some of the similarities with oh, yeah. then the Eludicea, um, and then also that Tasmaniana. Um, Tasmaniana. Mm -hmm. See, this is why we're doing this, because I'm, you know, you're you're teaching me. I'm figuring it out. Mm -hmm. It's good. Because man, the plane ride to Australia, it's long. So it is. I, I, I'll try to get there one day, but it's gonna be a minute. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at that. Lovely. Oh, a shout out to James Conway. Also mm -hmm. taking some great ultraviolet shots right there. That is a lovely shot. Yeah. The ultraviolet never gets old. It's mm -hmm. just cool. And shows off. It's not something I've gotten into yet. It's something I need to. Yeah, just buy you a little, you know, $50 uh, 365 nanometer ultraviolet flashlight and go to town. Mm -hmm. really cool but they are one of my favorite species i really like finding liberty caps you know and these were kind of like another thing that here in australia we've just kind of thought of as like a little bit of an urban myth like there were mm. records of them um in alpine tasmania and then alpine uh victoria and then I can't remember what year it was, but then I I found some near sea level in Tasmania and then I, I got onto one of the local groups and then was just like, is this Liberty Caps? No way, is this Liberty Caps? And they were like, God, yes, it is. So, so are you talking oh, about... God, if you even zoom in, you'll probably even find my record. D down south here, huh? Yeah. Uh, I think all three of those are mine. That's one of yours. Yep, there we go. All right. See guys, this is this is this is how INAT works, right? Like here it is. Yep. Here's a record. This is a record of a hike of a day of a time where he found a cool mushroom. And when he's a hundred and four years old, because we're all gonna live that long thanks to all the medicine we're, you know, mm -hmm. gonna be taking. <laughs> He can go back and reminisce and he can remember that day with throw that this is this is what's cool about I, I naturalist. Yep, this is great shot. I always tell people it's good to get a shot that kind of contextualizes exactly where they are a little bit more. So that's mm -hmm. uh I didn't realize I could zoom in and get much better looking photos. Yeah, you can. Yeah, there's your little bit of the pellicle you can see there. Uh, if you go to one of the other observations, you can actually get oh, okay. Um, Let's go back. Few better features. Oh, you went right, right. Yeah, back. this this is this is one of the things that drives me nuts. I don't know if I'm. Oh, uh, it is a bad feature, and like, yeah. Um, which one? Yeah, you, you're just gonna have to take a stab at one of those. Oh, there are three there. Mm. It's only two photos. No. Okay. No, not that one. All right, man. Is let's see if I can hack it. No, I probably can't. I just gotta keep doing it this way. Sorry, man. <laughs> we'll we'll find it. We'll find it. I know. I'm used to it. So he did that one there. That one up the back, probably. Yeah, I can't see from this. All right. So we we did the one. Try at... that one. Yeah, yeah. Try that one. I, yeah, this one has the most photos, so just statistically. No, so maybe, that's not it either. Oh, uh, these are dry. Or, well, okay, yeah, no, they're... All right, I think I'm down to one anyway, so. Yeah, you are. Of course, it'll be. It, it, it's that statistical thing. It's always the last one. <laughs> always the last one. Here we go. All right, so it was this one. But see, these are actually really common down in south of southeast tasmania man no it wasn't that one either so no, what that one either. Which, which one was it there's one missing uh look it, it doesn't matter at this point um i think i did them all yeah i must have what i might have done and this is the thing you can do is um 
you can keep records private. Oh. So you might not necessarily right. see it. I'm going to have to go yep. and just yeah, undo I, that. For, yeah, for I, 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 I did all four of those, so yeah, it wasn't there. Yeah, but... sorry, we've just got cool. wasted a bit of time doing that. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> we, 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 we demonstrated, you know, how you... That's the manual search feature right there. But the point being is that, um, like I was just saying, um, in southeast Tasmania, it's actually quite common if you go looking around this time of year. So, you know, it would be nice to know or how further distributed it is in southeast Tasmania. It'd be good to see other people put up records. Um, but, yes, you can also make records private. Right. Um, yes. So yeah, when when you find uh, that giant honey pot of morels and you don't want anybody to know, but two years from now you want to remember where it is, you just obscure it, and then then it's all for yep. you. It's all good. Yeah, exactly. There is a, there is also a level of I think of uh, research status where s some researchers can get access to that data as well. Yeah, you can grant privileges or you can make it part mm -hmm. of a project and all that cool stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know what I just thought of. So the all these observations, right? It makes me think of have you ever played the game Battleship? Yes. Do, I do have. you remember that game? You know, where you're trying to sink the battleship. So you say like B4, and then they go hit and you get a peg. And so you're like, okay, I I know it's around here, but now what orientation is it, right? Mm. I feel like these observations for mushrooms are just like that. Or like we mm. obviously haven't gone through every square meter of the earth looking for every single mushroom on earth but we got these little hits and the more hits you get the better that picture becomes and then the better future generations can go well i want to look for liberty caps i happen to be in tasmania oh what do you know at the right time it's just it's going to help it it, yeah. it it makes finding these things a whole lot easier uh so we're going to come back to i think sections veriginosa well, that's certainly how I'm referring to it. Other people probably still refer to it as section cyanesins. But I think one of the, I don't know, the, the more I dive into Siberiagnosa, the more I, I actually fall in love with it because of just the variety of species associated with it. And I think probably one of the big, the big ones that I think people are kind of getting really interested in is Psilocybe wiroa, um, which is from New Zealand. Um, and it's the weirdest thing because it's, 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 it's a, it's a pouch fungus. It's essentially like a, a truffle on a stem. Um, and it's referred to, it's a saccadioid fungus where essentially, and these are actually where the cap just doesn't open. So, and it's an evolutionary adaptation. Um, and essentially they just look like a ball on a stick it, they remain white in colour, which I'm really curious about is why. But they're really closely related to Siberiaginosa. Um, and essentially, I guess probably they are either one of the ancestral states of Siberiaginosa or there's something that has evolved from the ancestor of Siberiaginosa. It's like the weird uncle. It is. Yeah, it's like just, a really, yeah, just, really yeah, weird just, uncle. Yeah. Okay. Here. Yeah. I mean, you're you're painting a wonderful picture, but let's just take a look you at have it. To see this it's a really <laughs> weird looking mushroom. It's it's a beautiful organism. It's really lovely. That's it. All you right. can see it's still got gills on the inside. Mm -hmm. So the cat but are just, virtually still... trapped. Yes, they're, right. They're, they're trapped like in there. they're trapped. Yeah, look at that. It's like just a like a little mushroom lollipop right there. Mm -hmm. And now, am I seeing this correctly? Is there sort of like a veil? There is. Yes. Okay. There is sort of a veil, and you sometimes they actually open up a little bit. Like you can see, I think probably on that left hand specimen. Mm -hmm. There's a slide opening. It's like you can see just up into into the cap. Yeah. Oh yeah, here you can see 
the I don't know if you'd call that a court. I guess you would. Well, I don't you know how to call that a court right now. Yeah. yeah. It's just a little piece of it. Mm -hmm. It's like an inside out uh, Marcella. Yeah. And but this is a common it. thing that that is has happened to quite a few species of fungi in New Zealand. Um, and essentially, I think because it's so heavily forested, uh, it's essentially adapted to being um, that the cat opening and spreading by spores distribution has not worked so well. Um, and by being eaten by slugs, it means that the spores are more widely distributed. Oh, or wow. by looking like a berry mm -hmm. or a fruit, it's eaten. Yeah. birds are more likely to eat it and to then spread the spores. Wow. That is fascinating. Uh, so there's quite a few species that, that have done exactly the same thing. There's like a Cortinarius that's done it mm. um, and, and a few others. Yeah, I I know for a hot, I mean, I got a culture of it sitting on my, my shelf here. I have not tried to grow it out. I know a lot of people are trying. I, I don't keep up to know if someone has like had any sort of success whatsoever, but um, boy, it would be a cool one to grow because it's just the morphology is so strange. It is so odd. I mean, I, yeah. Now, we'd also discussed, I think, on our list, uh, Solos, it's currently, and I don't like it, <laughs> it should be referred to as something else, but it's referred to as Solosomy cyanesens va subsicotioid. Oh, yeah. So, so we, INAT failed us in this, in the over here, I say subsicoides. Now, how are you saying it? Subsicotioid. Subsicotioid. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, let me. I think I have this queued up somewhere. It's hard. You can't talk about Wurra without talking about the subsicotioid. Tell me about this. I, I have heard about it. Um, I have a friend who actually has it on wood chips right now, um, and is going to try to grow it. But I don't really know anything about it. Ah, brilliant! Right there, we are. And I believe this is from, I think, uh, Alan Rockefeller and Crime Pays, but Botany Doesn't Guy is talking about, they, they, I think he was talking a little bit about, you know, just, you know, lands being ravaged, you know, habitats being decimated. And yeah, so that's what I was referring to earlier. But. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, this is clearly growing in a wood chip bed somewhere. Yeah. Um. Right. One of the interesting things with this is the suspicion is uh, that this is an intermediate state between Solosibi subaruginosa and Solosibi wiruroa. So this is evolution mm. in happening. And you can kind of see it like you've got this, there's the open caps there. You can see that one there looks just like a little oh, yeah. dub pin. Yeah, like a little ghost. And, and yeah, you can tell it's like, mm, do I have to open up? Yeah, okay. and you can see some of those really, they're, they really want to just stay wrapped up. It's just like they're just opening just enough. Interesting. And then probably on some of those, like those ones there, if they were white, they would look just like a Wurraa. Right, yeah. Exactly. So now, when 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 did these hit everybody's radar? Um, I think I only just heard about them not even a year about ago. 10, about ten years ago. Okay. About ten years ago, uh, Shroomery member Inksky kind of really started to show them off, and and they kind of became a little bit more interesting. So, um, but they're either like an intermediate state between. Um, like a remnant population of like evolving from Siberiaginosa to Wuroa, or returning the other way. It's like a reverse. It's like oh, we no longer need to be like a truffle-like uh, cicotioid mushroom. Uh, 
we're now growing out in the wood chips so we can actually the caps kind of don't have to be totally closed up they can still open partially so who knows maybe another but the problem is with this is just like how long has this been happening is this a recent thing or is this just a population that's been present in the bush and through growing on wood chips it's it's just suddenly become a lot more popular which is kind of an interesting environmental thing too is is kind of like they might have been earmarked for um extinction um but with the appearance of modern humans or Europeans or you know and and our kind of spreading wood chips in our parks and things like that it's given this this organism the opportunity to jump out of a wild environment into a completely artificial environment and just go crazy right, so. right. without right we we use it just to suppress weeds but mm. here what a, what a fungi do they go we want to do something else with all that yeah all that that just looks like a whole big smorgasbord for us we're gonna start yeah. hanging out here and yeah, there's even something to be said for who knows the effect that might be having the just the predominant the ability for the, the mycelium to spread so rapidly through it all because it's so prime time for them. Mm -hmm. what, how, what effect is that having on their evolution, development, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, it'd be really nice, and I hope somebody in New Zealand does it. Uh, would be to then do the genome sequencing of those populations. I, mean, I was just yeah. saying, hey, entheome guys. <laughs> I mean, you got. I think you got the trifecta right here. We, you, you know, you got to do. You might have to do all three. Where Roa, Subsequites, and uh, Subruganosa just just knock those three out. Bam, bam, bam. We don't really have to worry about Subruganosa anymore because. Uh, Alistair has got so many oh, sequences oh, yeah, he did on, on the board. Um, you know, and I suspect there's probably... Um, yeah, it would be nice, though, to see someone in New Zealand go mm -hmm. ahead and do the work. Yeah. Um, you know, like if Entheon could help with that, right. I think right. I'd be more than willing to help try to get that off off the ground yeah that would be cool uh, it, it would be just you know respect to like uh because i know that these have been used traditionally in new zealand um as as part of ceremonies and and I, they're now revisiting that uh i know some of the some of the maori groups are revisiting we're a rower for you know for uh, treating mental health so Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, it's see, really so... Nice. So, you know, with respect to traditional usage, it would be nice to see someone in New Zealand to right. have, yes. have that opportunity to go ahead and actually do the genomic work and, and do that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, see, uh, now, I, I would assume many of my viewers know this, but maybe not all, right? There be before colonization... There's a whole group of Aboriginal people, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of tribes, but, you know, it's a big dynamic continent. And, uh, you know, this these mushrooms have been there for a while. So they were being used by, you know, Native peoples. And, yep, that's uh, for sure. You, that's I mean, that's really my deal, man. It's like who there wants to do this work, right? Like who with some context wants to do this work please let that person do the work yes mm -hmm. yeah that's uh, i i'm i'm in complete agreement on that one i think we're down to pan science and now i think what i would love to talk about with pan science is your pan science versus my pan science right like it, are there differences uh, for uh, Australian pans, are are they are they different? Is there? I I don't know, and I suspect they're probably pretty much the same. The same. Um, 
mind you, I think the thing with pan science, though, is they're not being cultivated in the same way as, say, you know, Cubensis. So, you know, like that was the thing with Alistair's work was to, was to show that a lot of the cultivated Cubensis, for example, are becoming really quite inbred and, you know, like we need to start to introduce some new genetics to, you know, to, to, to help these cultivars along. Um, we, I mean, I think that was discussed on maybe the third podcast I ever did. So it's like a hundred podcasts ago. And, and somebody said, you know, a lot of these we're bottlenecking them We're we're, you know, their cousins are breeding with their cousins and we're just getting, I mean, for a while we wanted mutations. We wanted weird things. We wanted interesting morphologies, but there's a point where now we're the vigor, the stability of the fruit, all this kind of stuff is beginning to seem like it's fallen off the rails a little bit. So for like the last year, there's definitely been a renewed interest in, in breeding some of these popular strains with land races. Again, how can we bring some wild genetics back into the picture and then rework it from there? So yeah. that's, yeah, the seeing his paper was like, amen. There it is. Abs actual evidence that what we thought was going on is actually going on. Yes. Yeah. I don't think we're at that stage with pan science yet. Um, you know, and I and I think there's some really interesting stuff, you know, like I think I think I don't yeah, like really interesting stuff. Like uh, a couple of pan science snuck in into the psilocybin cup last year. Um and and were rated really highly. Yeah. So oh, they're over there? here. They're killing it. Yeah, pans <laughs> are killing um, it, man. And see, they're highly sought after in northern, in northern parts of Australia, like in Queensland, because they're really potent. Like they're oh, yeah. super potent um, when they're fresh, um, but they they tend to be less potent when they're dried out. But from what I understand, these cultivated ones seem to be really, even dried out. They're really dried out they work just fine yeah and they're <laughs> they're we i've had a few people on who grow them um and i got a couple good friends that are very good at growing them and uh so you know i i've had a couple very mediocre tubs do do okay but um i i have i have given them a, the old college try and they are there's something special about them for sure yeah mm -hmm. they're, they're they have a nice quality and that was all dried so i i had <laughs> No complaints with the the cultivated dried stuff over here for sure. Yeah, I do feel though that it's probably uh you know another project that someone could probably come and do at some point is to, is just to compare the different populations of of pan cyans. Like, yeah, I mean, do Australian pan cyans are they different to like what you get in Hawaii or in in California? You know, and you guys have cubes, right? You guys also yeah. have cubes, and yeah. it seems like oh, they've no, been and, there. And it looks like there is a difference between different populations of cubes. So you would expect that. To answer your original question, I would suspect that yes, there is a difference, but it it comes down to to data. It comes down to people actually doing the work and doing the research. So. Yeah, I'd just be interested, even the ITS of it, like it, how, like is it spot on? Is it close? Like how many base pairs off is it? Uh, even that would just be interesting to me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm looking at photos here. They're, you know, they're, let's pull them up here. No, but we get them in large numbers here in, in Northern Australia. Um, you know, people just have handfuls of them and they do supposedly get really potent in some cases. They're a lovely mushroom. Oh yeah. You know, and that that I mean, blue color that really kind of comes through on the stem. Just... Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And then that the modeling of the gills. Yeah. Is cool. Um, Hence the name Paniolus. Yeah. Focus is wrong on that one. Okay. Mm. Looks like someone's had a bit of a go at a at an artificial bed there. Yeah. Like that doesn't exactly. Oh, a couple of lines down. So. Oh, where are you talking about? Right here. Uh, second row from the bottom. Oh, I see. Second, this wasn't even looking there. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. That that are, that's a real big cow, cow patty right party. there. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Look at that, guys. Don't grow them indoors. Just grow them outdoors. Oh, okay. Where Where's the... <laughs> that's, <laughs> the that? that's Alan's photo contextualizing where it's from. Because at first I was like, okay, oh. I do not see a mushroom in this photo. But okay, that, that must be him. No, right. Oh, sorry. Oh, there is a pan in there. Okay. At first I was like, yeah, I yeah. don't know why that's in there. but no, Someone's had a good day there. I found a whole bunch. Different yeah. different things. But you're right. Yeah, real real pronounced blue bruising. Very black spores. You can see the the middle. Um, oh, they are really yeah dark. Yeah, dark black. I mean, this is kind of one of those interesting cases where you've had like the psilocybin gene cluster, you know, move from one genus to another. So yep. The horizontal gene transfer. Yeah, we were, um, my buddy Chris Polly was telling me all about that. It's very, very fascinating. We're going to have him on soon. I had I had his partner on talking about uh, HPLC, and uh, we're going to have him on talking about some, some genetic stuff. Yeah. Yeah, these, so, yeah, these look about the same. I, I don't yeah. know if I can say they look too different, but what the heck is that all about? Oh, there's some ultra blue specimens. What is that? That is crazy. But yeah, no, we definitely like our pan cyans here in Australia. Definitely one of the one of the favorite species. Yeah. There's some cultivated ones. Ooh, what is this photo? No. I like this guy's style right here. <laughs> <laughs> that is very like 80s artistic. I dig it. Plump a pile of dung on top of a fence post. <laughs> and call it art. And call it art. All right. So we did, you know, we only have one left. Um, I mean, there's a couple more, but but we can't talk about them all. Um and man, I kept practicing yeah. saying this correctly. So I'm not even gonna try. It starts with the letter M. I'm just gonna oh. let you tell me how to say it. Oh, this is the one that's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> Macarore? Macarore AFF jelly subs. So there is a there is a species, Psilocybe Macarore. This is a New Zealand species. It's very, very rare. And it's also very, very closely related, again, to Psilocybe subarigonosa. It all comes, it's like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or is the seven degrees of Savarugonasa. Mm, like it all comes yep. back to Savarugonasa. All right. This is Jerry Cooper. I don't know this guy, but this is some mm -hmm. nice DIC mic microscopy yep. here. I mean, these are really difficult. Unless you see them in habitat, mm -hmm. they kind of become a little bit difficult to really differentiate. I think it's essentially, it's the features on the stem that really show them off as macarore. And, and so what is, you're saying you need to see them in habitat. What is the uniqueness of the habitat? Um, like is, it a, so is it a like, different habitat than... Well, in, yes, in Australia, it's eucalyptus, okay. whereas in New Zealand, it's it's different trees. You've got, um, what have you got? You've got the Nothophagus forest, but then you've also got, like, lots of uh, tea tree, um, Malaluca, mm. uh, and other species. So here, you, this is the one I think really shows these off, if you want to zoom in. It's just kind of the shape of the cap is like really oh, that's different. As far in as I can go. Oh, yeah. Here, but the... also see the 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 blue kind of scaling running down the, mm -hmm. the stipe. Like you don't yeah, typically that's... get that with Severiginosa. I mean, if at all. Yeah, it's, it's really like... really blue. 
Mm. And it doesn't look like it's blue from handling it. It looks like it just naturally just seems naturally to do that. Blue. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. I've seen Severignosa fairly close to these, but they, they just have a slightly different look. All right. Here's how you know they're rare that I didn't even get to scroll down very far. <laughs> nope. Nope. That's all she wrote on that one. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're so you're this is um, only New Zealand, yeah. Okay, this is only New Zealand, you don't get these in Australia, they are really, really closely. Um, I mean, this whole group is really, really closely related, and it's really kind of problematic. And I know Alistair has a like, there's the preprint paper, and hopefully, like, the yeah, actual. Sure peer review paper comes out soon um, but his paper really shows off how bad ITS can be for some for some sections so like right. if you do a phylogenetic tree of this group so Siberiganosa, Wiraroa um, you know even Cyanese and Vazuresins um, the the Subsequidioi Sub and the Macarore it, it gets really messy like you know, like they're all kind of lumped in against each other, and mm. and it's kind of it's really difficult to see to see how you can pull a species out as a species in some cases, and that was the thing like with the jelly subs, the Macarora A double F. Now, do you have a photo of that prepped or? So wait, which one? I don't think I. I thought that. Hold on, let me check something here real quick. <laughs> I was I was running out of photos, so let me let me go back to my notes here. Hang on, I wonder if I've got any. Oh, you could probably do a quick Facebook search in um, Good Lovers United. So jelly, I thought jelly subs was the same thing. I thought that was another term for macarori, but. No, it's something else. No. All right. And it's just spelled like jelly, J E L L Y. Yeah. All right. Yeah, sure. Let me let's see what all Facebook has in store for us here. Sorry, you're going to have to edit this bit out. And oh, yeah. That's fine. Chuck it together. <laughs> oh, yeah. So here, so I'm actually going to have this guy in. Do you know Jack Cyan? I do. <laughs> yeah, he, he and I have, have argued a little bit about this point. Okay. So, yeah, he's just calling them jelly subs. Very wet. He must be missing the hell out of these things. Mm, I think so. Yeah. No, that's. Yeah. Uh, see, the more I look at that, the less I see the actual jelly. <laughs> They're a beautiful mushroom. They look really, really lovely. I love the color that comes through in these, but yeah, these do have a very. So, so the point of contention is you think this is different than. Uh, I think Macarori. these are just Severiginosa. Oh, just Severiginosa. Okay. I think these are just Severiginosa because when I do phylogenetic trees, um, you know, and, and people have got the um, ITS sequences of this out there in the community um you can do the phylogenetic trees oh see there that that really shows off that jelly feature oh yeah i see but sometimes you'll get reverts that just look like seberiginosa but i was saying like if you do the phylogenetics and it's really hard to kind of talk about it in a way because like Alistair's demonstrated the ITS in this group is is just no good. Um, it's not helpful. But the Macarora AFF jelly sub appears in a completely different place than what uh, the actual Macarore do. And it just it just gets turned up amongst Siberiaginosa. And so they, to me, they, got... they just look like the, Siberiaginosa. The Macarore <laughs> And is the idea that the macarori 
do not have the same sort of gelatinous quality to the cap, whereas these do. Is this where this all started? Uh, I think it's just that Macarore is so similar to Severaganosa that it actually gets really hard to see the difference between the two. Who knows? I mean, it's it's without having the genome to really compare, it gets really tricky. But again, I think this is work for someone in New Zealand to kind of have a go at is to, you know, like when Alistair sequences are publicly available and they can get the genome of, of Macabrore, they can actually compare the two. Um, you know, it'd be nice to actually see it remain of its own species, but who knows? It could actually just get lumped in amongst the Siberiaganosa. I mean, right at the end of the day, we you just you want to know. You just want to know. Is it the is it the same? Is it different? That's what we're doing here. Yeah, but you can see in some of those photos, if you spend a bit of time kind of going through the photos, you can kind of see that there is a a, a texture difference in in the stipe. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they look a little different to me, but I mean, not radically different, but mm. yeah. Again, sometimes with these, with the photos, you know, if you're not there and you haven't touched it and picked it and felt the quality of the, you know, the, the, the fruit itself, you just, you just don't even really know. You're just looking at a picture. So it's oh, look, people absolutely. like you guys who have touched them and felt them and, and experienced them. You guys have a better qualitative mm -hmm. understanding of it. Yeah. For it's a support. No, photos can be really, really tricky. Um, you know, and I think this is where Alan's photos are, are excellent in that he does light things up in a way that that shows off features. Oh yeah, and photo stacks, and yeah, he. I mean, it, the photos are exceptional. You just mm -hmm. you get so much information from them. It's it's very helpful. Yeah, not everyone's doing that. That's why everybody who starts uploading the iNaturalist, right? You know, you got to know all the photos you need to take. You got to mm -hmm. take a photo of the cap. You got to take a top view, a side view. You got to take a gill shot. You got to pick it and lay it down and show it in context to where it grew from and, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It helps not having one photo. My favorite is where I find an observation of something I'm looking for and I go, oh, yay, here it is. And this is kind of great where I think I found it. And then it's like one terrible photo. And I'm like, I can't, I don't even know if that's what it is. It's just of the cap. So the cap. And the cap is kind of half obscured in grass. You can't see the stem. So <laughs> you can't useless. see any of the gills features. Yeah. Yep. Kind of like. Yeah. Well, that that's that's the Facebook side of iNaturalist. Those are the mm -hmm. like the the very casual users. Yes. But we got to train people. We got to teach them how to use it. Just put a little bit more energy into it, and it's worth it. Well, that uh, that's cool, man. Whoa. I feel like I got a little more of a handle on some of these. Mm -hmm. um definitely still plenty to figure out oh look i think there's a lot more work to be done with that whole section uh sparagonosa section cyanesins however you know you kind of want to call it um yeah i mean for me one of the bigger things um is also then the whole woodlover paralysis aspect of this Ooh, now like don't this. you're getting me excited now. Yes. Let's, <laughs> yes, this is a this is a hot topic in, in, in the community. Right. This has become one of my core interests over the last couple of years. Um, you know, and it's kind of interesting looking at how so the, the section of Siberiaganosa has like a different um psilocybin gene cluster to say some of the other psilocybes. Um for your viewers, you know, you might want to check out the the Bradshaw 2024 paper that really starts to go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, what was it called? Phylogenomics of the psychoactive mushroom genus psilocybe and evolution of the psilocybin biosynthetic gene cluster. Um, I have linked that before, but I will link it again in this episode so people can check it out. Yeah. But yeah, but, um, but you can see that that section cyanesins. I think I think in the Bradshaw paper is all, all lumped into section cubense. So, oh, but 
you can then see with Seberogonosa, Azuricins, and Cyanesins is, is the gene cluster is kind of a little bit different to a lot of the others. Like there's double ups on uh, the Cy H gene. In fact, I think if you go to, oh, again, this is Alistair's preprint, because um, he's then gone through a lot of his his genomes and he's then just mm. kind of lined up you know, how wobbly the, the psilocybin gene cluster is just within Seberogonosa. Right. Um, and a lot of people don't know, those are, right, the way all this stuff works is you can have, you know, like your Psi M or your Psi H, you know, is one little section, and then your, your, your Psi M is another section, or that might be multiple sections. And so finding out exactly, this is why full genome is very important, because then it starts really showing you some functional differences, like how is this organism actually, you know, absolutely, yeah, transcribing no, these proteins, making these molecules, making these things, you know, these chemicals, mm -hmm. you know. And we were talking earlier about different mushrooms potentially having different effects, possibly because of variations then in the psilocybin gene cluster, um, and then being able to link back like the entourage effect to right. changes in the psilocybin gene cluster. So and um, we're just barely starting to scratch the surface of any of that stuff. Really are. Like, and I and I yeah, and I'm trying to pull the wood lover paralysis back into this because I do wonder if, you know, some of these weird little changes that we're seeing in, in that section kind of may then help lead towards better understanding what right. wood lover's paralysis is. I definitely want to talk about this study you guys did, right? This sort of like qualitative, because this is, you know, you you took the next step. You guys tried to figure some stuff out, and uh, it was very fascinating to watch that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, this was this study that that you've mentioned, Geeky, is a study I did with colleague Simon Beck, um, where we got together and. Uh, came up with a survey of, I think it was about 65 different questions looking at, um, and we tried to cover everything um, from, you know, like where did you collect the mushrooms? What were they, what, what was the habitat that they were growing in? What was the substrate that they were growing from? Uh, then through to actual the physical effects, like, you know, like, did it affect your just your legs and arms or did it affect your eating did it affect um your breathing or anything like that um and then covering a whole bunch of other points of like how did people react to it how long did the effect last um you know were you freaked out by it or were you okay by it and you know and looking at whether you'd ever experienced it um or did you experience it in just the last time that you took like a wood loving mushroom? So things like that. We, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot there to cover. And really, I, I, you know, there's too much to cover kind of in this. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, well, I'll, and I'll link, I can, I can put the link yeah. to that video as well. Mm -hmm. One thing that fascinated me was that you had, I forget the percentage, but quite a few people who had said they had experienced this, had experienced it multiple times. Yes. <laughs> we had and one person who had experienced it like a hundred times. Oh, yeah. What? 100, 144 times. 144 times. He's counting. Obviously, he's keeping track. I mean, that's yes. a specific number. Yeah. Like, that dude I want to find this. that guy. I, I, I can raise some scratch and we're going to put a EEG on that guy and we're going to give him some subaruginosa and we're going to find that we're going to get to the bottom of this. I think that was what was the most compelling from that was that there were many people who didn't experience this and go never again. They said, yeah, cool. This is part of the trip. Okay. And yeah. had, yeah, that, that was crazy to me. Mm hmm I don't oh, think it would, yeah. it wouldn't stop no. me from trying it, but um, I can imagine it would be pretty unnerving to just, yeah, not, not 
be able to control your own body. Yes. Yeah. Not cool. But then you, the other thing that was fascinating to me is that there did seem to be a small amount of people that felt like there. So most people, you guys said, you know, went away pretty rapidly. One, one to three days and, and symptoms are gone. But there were a tiny amount of people that said they felt like there was some sort of persistent symptom that 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 was still there and i was like wow really like how mm. it that just made me yeah, want to know more about this and things like that so yeah. that's something for someone else to come back to it was interesting to, to note it uh our bigger concern was that it did last like a couple of days afterwards you know up to three days you could still um experience like pronounced effects but most people, it was just a two-day thing, um, you know, and and it was just that thing of like, you, you know, you think the the trip is over, you wake up the following morning and it's like, oh, excellent, right, it's all done. That was a hell of a time, yep. <laughs> uh, you know. But then you go to walk down to the shop, or or even worse, you get on a bicycle and and decide to, and bam, it kicks in and you fall off your bike or you fall over. That is crazy. Um, you know, and it's just like, well, that's really weird and interesting. But also from a harm reduction point, you know, like, you just oh, be yeah. careful the, the day after. If you No bicycle see. riding. Don't go any long car trips. No, you got to play it safe for a couple of days. Yes. Yep. That's interesting. Now, um, do you guys have any plans to do that again, to do a broader canvas to, you know, as interest grows, as more people are doing this, are you going to revisit that? Is somebody else shown interest in? There's been a lot of interest in it. There is a lot of interest in it. Um, I think a lot of the interest is in the chemical aspect of it, of, you know, like what it, what's causing this problem? You know, like, and that's that's been pretty much our main concern. It's like, well, yeah, what is causing it? Because until you know what's really causing it, you can't then start to do the genomic work of identifying what genes are responsible. Like, it'd be nice to kind of think it's something in the psilocybin gene cluster that's kind of responsible for this, um, but we don't know. Um, but we also suspect that because not every patch produces the effect. Uh, some patches do produce it, other patches don't produce it. Uh, and so there's people who are like, they can consistently go back to the same patch year after year after year, and those mushrooms will consistently, year after year after year, produce the, the paralysis effect. And others won't? And others won't. Whoa. Mm. So that's like that's like environmental, epigenetic, like what what is that all oh, about? Oh. We kind of suspect it's allelic. It's just like oh. it might be like a recessive gene or something. That, okay, you know, you you've just got through breeding the the two recessive right. genes align and bam, mm -hmm. you know, you've you've just got this. Chemical now you just got to figure out what those two recessive genes did. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to yeah. yeah, no, there has been a lot of kind of conversation around is it just an environmental toxin and that's why we went into the habitat aspect as well so it doesn't seem to matter what the habitat is it doesn't seem to matter what the substrate is um, that any substrate any habitat can produce mushrooms that produce wood lover paralysis and did you do any plotting like on a map of you know Subaruginosa overall versus wood lover paralysis causing subaruginosa uh, look, points. From from kind of just general responses, we can tell that it's pretty much all over Australia, uh, throughout America, um, and also then I think we had a couple of cases from Europe as well. Mm. So, but mo but mostly Australia, mostly Australia. I mean. Yeah, okay. It's, I mean, we've got a statistical bias there towards Australia because, you know, like even though we advertised on like Wood Lovers United and I think Pacific Northwest Mushrooms uh, and then a couple other places, you know, the majority of, of the people who saw our call out were in Australia. So. Sure. 
Um, so there's I, a, saw, I remember it. I, I saw it. Um, I mean, I, I didn't ever experience it. So I was like, okay, cool. Can't wait yep. to see what comes of that. Mm -hmm. No. Very cool. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And there are kind of concerns around, you know, like for most it's, it is, you know, like we have to be careful with the numbers, you know, like, because we're also biased towards people who had experienced it. So we had like what, 392 people in our case study and then 165 of those had experience with level paralysis, but that's not a real reflection on, you know, the true occurrence of it. You know, it's just like people have like, God, yes, I've had that. I really want to communicate um, the effects that I've had and, and help with this particular study. Versus so, people that just were like, yeah, I've tried those, but, you know, it was fine. Yeah. It was nice to get some stats just out of just kind of ordinary trippers too. So, mm -hmm. so that was nice. Um, but, yeah, no, we do still consider this a rare thing. Um, the majority of people seem to really only experience paralysis of their arms and legs. Um, oh. But there have been cases of where people have had paralysis of their, of their mouth. Um, Yikes. But for us, the biggest the biggest concern is people who have experienced paralysis with their breathing, because it does happen. Right. Um, yeah, if you can't swallow and you can't breathe, that's you know it causes mm -hmm. problems. Yeah. 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 But now, how many out of the what do you say, 160 some people that had experienced it? How many people said that they had significant problems breathing requiring hospitalization? Um. Oh, we had five people call the ambulance okay. for it. So um, that's crazy that only five. I, I honestly feel like that's lower than I would have expected it to be. Yep. So maybe it's uh, so. And I remember you guys saying a fair number of people said like they thought it was part of the deal and they didn't view it negatively at all. They just kind of mm -hmm. went along with it. Yep. And I was like, those are my psychonauts. Good for you guys. <laughs> you just put your hands yeah. up and went along for the ride. Or in this case, they, you couldn't put your hands up, but metaphorically speaking. Yeah, pretty much that. Yeah. yeah. No, but we are but we are aware of at least, well, I personally am aware of one case where someone needed CPR because... Ooh. Yeah. And did... No. and were So they were medically evaluated, though. That Was that ever... Was there ever an actual kind of normal medical explanation for that? Or was that still, yeah, they just, okay. No, see, the problem is, is there's no recognition of it as a, as a thing. Right. Uh, and, and hence why kind of Simon and I have been working hard to go through the data uh, and actually publish the results so that, um, you know, so that toxicologists are aware of it, so that medical experts are aware of it. Um, you know, someone presents to the hospital and it's just like, I can't breathe. Um, you know, what have you taken? Oh, you know, magic mushrooms. And it's just like, well, you know, maybe you're just tripping. <laughs> you know, no, we want people to recognize this as a, as a proper uh, toxidrome uh, and to kind of start thinking about this as a serious thing because, because yeah, you know, like, um, yeah, we're aware of someone last year who kept someone alive using CPR, uh, and then that person was put on a on a ventilator. So for how really for how long? Um, Do you not I think happen until, to know? essentially the effects wore off. I I don't know the exact details. Uh, yeah, um, but there I know Simon has prepped a, a case a case study. Interesting. I know. So if somebody came into my ER and was saying, I can't move my arms or I can't move my legs and, and people do come into the ER and say these things, you know, we're, we're ruling out a stroke. So we're probably getting a CAT scan. We're trying to see what's yeah. going on, you know, vascular wise in the brain, uh, you know, as best we can with a CT, see if there's any hemorrhage, if there's any head injury. Um, we're doing an NIH scale. We're, we're kind of doing a, battery of basic things just to see what's going on but realistically those people end up getting uh and if nothing shows up 
they get admitted, they go to neurology, they, they get a neuro workup, they get EEGs, they usually get an MRI, all that stuff. Man, it would be great to get your hands on one of these guys that says he has it happen to him all the time and have him volunteer to do it. And you guys could figure it all out with that one guy probably, or at least potentially figure it out with, with that guy. Yeah. It's the, when well, everything's look, anecdotal and nobody goes to the hospital, you got no baseline data on any of these people. You just don't mm -hmm. know what it is. Yep. Look, we hope by raising awareness of this, that, that exactly that kind of thing can happen. It's just like, well, but also, yeah, you know, there's an ethical thing there, don't you? Of, you know, <laughs> You're not going to get that through an ethics committee of of someone, right? Deliberately dosing. But Kane, um, you <laughs> EEGs are cheap. You can buy one on eBay, dude. You can buy a, buy your own EEG, and you know it can be all off the record and sign your waiver. You know you're not twisting the guy's arm. He just happens to be there, and he just happens to. It could be done. Could be, it could done. be done. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going to do it, but somebody could mm -hmm. do it. Yeah, and otherwise you're never going to figure. Uh, you you got to figure out what's actually going on in the person's body when this is happening. I feel like you got to figure that piece out, and then a lot of things probably will start making sense. And yeah, so hopefully what you guys did will get somebody to go, "Hey, I got an idea. Maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. Mm -hmm. That would be very cool." I mean, look, that's exactly kind of the point of what we're doing. Is like, is hopefully at some point. Actually, no, not hopefully. I don't want people to experience with lover paralysis to that degree. Um, right. You know, I want people to have a nice experience. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then be able to, you know, wake up the next day and be all good. But if someone does happen to end up in emergency because of wood lover paralysis, it'd be nice that there was someone who was aware of it who could just go, Oh yeah, I've heard of this. I've read the paper. Um, it'd be really cool to. Do you mind if I sign off on this and and we can do some, you know, brain scans? That's, that would be thing. yes. Um, and even even if the people who have experienced it get educated and say, "Hey, if you have this happen and you need to seek hospitalization." immediately request an EEG. It, it, you know, these are the things you want done um, it, if they knew those things going in. Because, man, hearing you guys talk, I was like, man, I wish I could just get my hands on one of those medical records mm -hmm. to see, like, what diagnostic was done, what they figured out. That might give, you know, some some clues into all that. But HIPAA. Well, our, our our privacy, like our medical privacy, we is called HIPAA. And so... HIPAA prevents us from doing a lot of, right? HIPAA was to protect our privacy, but then it also makes a lot of other things very complicated and difficult to, that, that might be good for people. But can't do yeah. them. Mm. What are you going to do? Ethics, right? We can't just, we got to actually think ethically about all this stuff or yeah. we get into trouble and yeah, it doesn't go so well. I would think that most people who have, and I think this was one of the things that came out of our survey, was that people who had experienced it were more than happy to fill out the survey and to, you know, give us their own, um, to give us their info, to give us their experiential reports and, and to want to talk about it. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of been this thing that people have just kind of been putting off for, I think, for a long time, and suddenly the community is starting to take it seriously, um, you know. And so the survey that we did was then an opportunity for people to really come forward and go, yes, I've had this numerous times, and I want to tell you about it. Um, I think if someone presented to emergency um, under the effect, they would probably be inclined to go, yeah, I have would love a paralysis. Yep. Where do I sign to let you, you know, collect some further data? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I also thought it was interesting. I, I think I thought that it was extremely rare, but when it happened, it was awful that it was just like hugely traumatizing. Now there were people that reported s some lingering traumatic effects from it. 
But for the oh, most okay. part, it, it seemed like a lot of people were really, it was like maybe not enjoyable, yeah. but most people, I think, what was it, 20-ish percent said that maybe some like mild lingering traumatic feelings around it. But a lot yeah. of people were like, cool, let's do it again. Like it didn't even keep people from wanting to continue to to use whichever mm -hmm. specific species they use, which I that that changed my understanding from things I had heard. So it was cool. Yeah. No, no, they, they, we, it was kind of surprising to us. It was like there are people who are perfectly happy just to kind of do it again. It's like, okay, yep. <laughs> I got wood lovers paralysis again. I'll just lie back and just kind of relax into it. So, you know, that, that was really interesting. Um, that there are people out there who are happy just to kind of do a little bit of self-experimentation and go for it. Make the most yeah. of the experience. Yes. I guess if, if the gestalt of the experience is amazing, then, you know, one little aspect it maybe skews a little negative overall must be pretty great because it didn't seem like it was stopping the majority of the people seem mm. to be yeah. very tolerant of that experience, which was very different from my assumption of what I thought about before I ever saw the video of you guys talking through the results. So I think you guys figured a lot of things out and definitely gave people a lot of reason to, if it happens to them, to talk about it, to, you know, gauge that experience, to see where it falls. I know um, in one comment when I was watching the video, somebody went into a little bit of detail saying like, I had this experience, this was my experience. Um, so I was like, oh, it, it's definitely... You know, it generates, it basically says it's okay to talk about this, that, that somebody cares and we want to understand more about it and definitely, you know, trying to assess the safety concerns that might or might not be there. So it seemed like it was a very responsible thing to do. Like it, mm. it, 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 it provided a service, even if it didn't go anywhere else, it would, it made me go, oh, I would try this. Sure. Whereas before I was like, nah, I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to be completely paralyzed for six hours. I don't know how I feel about that. But after watching that video, I was like, eh, maybe I'd give it a try. That's cool. Yeah. It's, it's been a tricky one because, like, you don't want to scare people off. Um, but you also need to raise awareness about this. And, and I think particularly in the cases where you do have people who have had significant problems breathing, I, you know, like it's kind of, you do need to be aware that if you're taking a really high dose, that might be something that occurs. So, you know, and it brings up like the harm reduction stuff of, you know, it's, it's, it's good to have a sit tripper and, you know, and it's good to do things like homogenizing your mushrooms, um, which is probably a good thing anyway. You know, like if you're collecting a lot of mushrooms, it's good to just homogenize so that you know how to be consistent about your dosing from those mushrooms. Um, and also if, if, you know, and I guess with subs, you might be collecting from multiple patches. You might collect from a patch that does have woodlover paralysis and one that doesn't. And I don't know. It gets a little tricky because then at the same time, it's like, well, Hang on a minute. Maybe you <laughs> sample from each patch before you homogenize. Right. So things like that. Oh, you just gave me an idea. I mean, we spent half the time here talking about iNaturalist observations. Now I'm going, how do we how do we segue off of that preliminary study into uh, a map that then shows like a, a field in the iNet observation that says, is this a region where there's been a reported wood lovers paralysis that could be cool but then you yeah. got to just go back and ask everybody permission or you got to probably you have to make them do it or, or encourage them to do it themselves mm. probably i think just to be safe about that but it's not the first time that that's come up um and i and i i do i really like the idea and i think it would possibly be beneficial in time um my only thought about that was that perhaps contacting someone uh, at INAT and going, what are the actual legal implications of asking questions like, 
like that, you know, because, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure they, if they can as long as it doesn't lawyer, come back on iNaturalist in any way, they'll be fine. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I like, I mean, they're posting things like death caps and stuff, so that's true. They're pr they're probably okay. I would assume that they're fine, they're safe. So, no, I, I do, I like the idea. Yeah, uh, cool. And it has come up before that it would be nice to be able to use, because you can't do that. You can create custom fields right. on INET to, to track things like that. Yeah, like, you know, like I have a private field in my, my thing that says, um, you know, farmer chase me out of the the the, the cow pasture, right? Or guy showed up with a gun and told me to get off his property, right? Like little practical bits of information that would in this case that would be a very cool field to have um i think i think i don't i didn't even think about the inat as much as i thought well then you got the opposite now you're gonna have some weirdos who are gonna specifically go to the patch that has wood lovers paralysis and just get themselves in trouble no and that's what my thought process was was you know like that it does open up the space for someone to then get themselves into trouble. It's like, oh yeah, would love it. I want to try this. And this shit, you know, and they end up in an emergency yeah. or something. And right. <laughs> yeah. And then they oh, go, sorry. Well, I found the information on INAT and this yeah. guy from Australia added the field. So yeah, I I think at the end of the day it's it's probably a no no go on that mm. one. But boy, it would be for for responsible human beings, it would be a, a good field to have. Yeah, yeah. But these days, man, you just there's always going to be a loose cannon. There's always going to be an outlier. Somebody just doing the complete opposite of what you thought the thing you 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 tried to do was for not doing that. So yeah. Oh look, no, but uh, that's that's why I think harm reduction information is is so important. Uh, you know, and I, I mentioned how I work with Entheogenesis Australis, and that's something that we're very, very passionate about, is being able to help educate people about about the species that they might want to go and collect, the species that they, they don't want to collect. You know, uh, we've got a number of videos that we've created to help educate local people for, um, you know, what species around might cause trouble. Um, you know, harm reduction about uh, would love a paralysis and things like that. So very important as this gets more mainstream, more trendy, more you know, peaked curiosities across the board. It is very important to educate because yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, you could be playing with fire. So. Yeah, good for you guys for doing that. I when I was looking for uh, that the one video you finally sent me, um, I I stumbled across some of those others, and I was like, oh, cool, Psilocybe and their lookalikes, and oh, great, yeah, they're they're definitely doing their job educating everybody who is interested in this right now. That's mm -hmm. so good, so good. Well, man, we're coming up on two and a half hours. We've talked about yeah. the mushrooms. We we we've we've definitely given people a taste of who you are and why you love mushrooms so much. This has been super fun. Um, we even got to talk about wood lovers paralysis. So this, I think, this is great. We I would love to have you back on, especially when you guys get this new paper published. I think there might be some interesting things to talk about. Might not have to be two and a half hours. I think Simon would be happy to come back talk about um love of paralysis i mean he he can definitely talk about you know like the whole physiological aspects um okay um you know some of the that would be fun medical aspects of it so, right okay um, let's do it it's de that's he, definitely he, he, a... it. He, he tends to really enjoy talking about the will of paralysis stuff and i like it well, so how about this? We can get you, him, and then I got a buddy who is a retired brain surgeon. He's a neurotrauma surgeon, and he's quite interested in all this stuff. I, and we, we've we lightly talked about it in an episode, but I think that would be a super fun, just let you guys just 
talk it up. Just talk about what you guys found out and theories and that that could be a fun fun little segment for sure. You, I know you still have a good chunk of your day left. I'm 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 coming up on midnight right now over here. So I got to go to bed. I got to be up in about 5 hours to get my kids ready for school. Oh uh, dude, I'm, sorry. <laughs> oh no, this I I've done this many this is just part of the deal for me. I I'm used okay. to it. Um, All right. This okay. is not the latest I've been. I have been up recording these till two in the morning and then have to get up at five and 30 in the morning. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> it is what it is. It's a passion project. So I know how conversations can just go on and on and on and on. And um, yeah, no, I've thoroughly enjoyed this chat. It's been really good. It's been good yeah, I love it. this, right? It's fun to talk to people instead of texting them or maybe emailing them. It's fun to actually talk to people. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so thanks for inviting me on. Um, absolutely. It's pleasure's all mine. Uh, can't wait to do it again. And we will uh, talk soon. All right, guys, that was Kane Barlow. Man, what a cool dude. I, I'm sad he lives so far away from me, but it, it is what it is. Anyway, um, you know what? It's really cool. A lot of the guests I've had on lately um, are telling this wonderful story that at least this is what I'm hearing. It's the I really love mushrooms. And I didn't let anybody get in the way of that. I made some decisions in my life that, that allowed me to continue to pursue my bliss, pursue the things that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I just love hearing people tell those stories over and over and over again. It never gets old for me. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I got a lot of fascinating guests coming up. Spring is sprung. It's, uh, it's an exciting time. I am having a blast out in the woods right now. I hope you guys get out there. Um, also, speaking of getting out in the woods, don't forget, I still got spots for the Mexico trip. Um, that's going to be July 14th through the 21st uh, in Jalapa, Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, we're going to be hanging out with local guides, taking us to all sorts of cool places. We're going to learn about the region. We're going to learn about the geography. We're going to learn about the mushrooms that grow there. Uh, it's going to be a good time, guys. So anyway, if you don't have anything going on in July and you're looking for something to do, you might want to consider checking out mycotrex.tours and, uh, you know, get, give it a thought. Anyway, we're going to have a good time. When we get back, we're going to have plenty of photos and videos and information to share with you guys. So uh, even if you can't go, don't, don't even sweat it. We're going to make you feel like you had a chance to go as well. Um, and until next week, Go grow some mushrooms, but also don't just stay in your lab growing mushrooms. Get out in the woods and go mushroom hunting, guys.